I think we're about ready to start now. This is uh, the new intro should be just about finished at this stage. And it's always hard to know how to time these things because of the lag that occurs on YouTube. Hopefully everyone's hearing me right now. Um, not exactly a new setup, but I haven't gotten my soundboard in yet. Uh, so there's still going to be a little bit of a tinny quality to the whole endeavor. I also wanted to get a new microphone. That didn't happen. But anyway... Uh, I hope everyone liked the intro music. This is a new edition. Uh, I've changed the name of the podcast to Broadcasts from Fiddler's Green, which is my substack. It's also kind of a reference to Neil Gaiman's Sandman, uh, if, you ever, if you're aware of that graphic novel series, which I've been told has been sort of butchered by, what is it, Netflix, who've turned it into a series. But at any rate, I wanted to kind of... Um, I kind of wanted to invoke some Americana or some old folk ways. So I thought that it would be really good to have fiddle music. And so I chose some Scottish fiddle music from the Scottish fiddler Alistair Fraser and an American celloist, Natalie Haas, who's sister of the fiddler from Crooked Still, which is a Massachusetts-based bluegrass band. That's from a live performance, actually, so it's not going to get DMCA'd, or I don't think it will. But anyway, uh, if people want to have something different for intro music, feel free to give me suggestions. But I'm doing what I can for now. And, uh, you know, just give me suggestions and hopefully we'll improve the quality of the broadcast as we go on here. Uh, I, I have a new camera angle, too. So, so hopefully this works. So for people who've been sort of following my personal life, uh, this was I was supposed to come back and, and broadcast, do a podcast this week. I actually thought I might be podcasting a little bit earlier because for the last two weeks, I was supposed to be on vacation. Of course, the second I get off the plane uh, to go to the West Coast and visit all my old friends, the next day I immediately contract what is, uh, well, what the home tests are telling me is COVID uh, and what feels like uh, a really, really hard kicking flu. And of course, this pretty much ruins the vacation straight up. I spend most of the time that I was really hoping to use to reconnect to the real life and old friends and to, to talk to people coming out of the quarantine. <clears throat> I spent almost all of that in a hotel room quarantining away from everyone that I was sending out to visit in the first place. And uh, so for the most part, I, I, was, I was just left to my own devices uh, I, I had a book with me, Woman in the Dunes, to finish that one. That was something a book I got halfway through. But it turns out when you're sitting in a hotel room under quarantine, running a fever, uh, reading a story about someone being trapped in a, in a village, in a Kafkaesque Japanese village of sand dunes, isn't very, isn't very cathartic. So I switched halfway through to uh, the deck, the Decameron. Uh, and that was much better. The Decameron is, oh, I forget the, the how to pronounce the author's name. It's a uh, Bachachia, I think, or something like that. That's horribly mispronounced. Um, but it's an it's a Italian novel from the late 14th century. So a little bit before Canterbury Tales, but about, I think, about 70 or 80 years after Dante's Divine Comedy. And it's about refugees from the city of Florence escaping the plague, telling stories. And it's a really delightful book. The intro is really grim about everyone dying of the Black Death. And then you get onto these kind of delightfully lighthearted medieval short stories, a little bit like the Arabian Nights. Not, not, not quite as juicy as the Arabian Nights. The Arabian Nights are a lot more fun, to, to be honest. But still, they, they have this very poetic dimension to them. And... I think that they make the perfect reading when you're really, really sick and being kind of uh, spirited away in quarantine. So that's, uh, yeah, it's it's Boccaccio. Boccaccio? Boccaccio, that's it. Okay, so yeah. Um, I should have practiced the pronunciation of that before I actually <laughs> told the story. But, you know, it's it's funny because this sort of screwed up my entire plan for would I be talking about for the next few weeks? I thought I'd be talking about trying to reconnect with the old world, trying to get back to your roots, trying to see how things have changed and how they haven't since the quarantine or since COVID was over. Um, of course, I experienced absolutely none of that. It was um, you know, I'm glad I was able to salvage half of it 
by coming back early. Um, so I salvaged some of my vacation time, but I, I didn't I didn't get any chance to really connect with people uh, nearly to the extent that I wanted to, and most of the time I was in quarantine. And when I wasn't in quarantine, you know, no one wants to come up and visit somebody who's coming back from a highly contagious fever. And of course, a part of the time was also uh, taking care of my wife, who was uh, who had come down with the very same thing. So anyway, um, yeah, this is this is going to be a podcast that might be more par for the course for distributed content. I, I don't want to apologize for it because I think it's something that needs to be talked about. But this is something this is something that I've been talking about since my channel began. And uh, so, you know, it's just the changing nature of the dialectic and how I think this is becoming more and more apparent and how this is this has resulted in things sort of dying away really quickly. When I was back at home, I remember my mother telling me or making the observation that everyone is really burnt out on politics. And, and indeed, I think everyone is. And so a day or two later, when I was sitting in quarantine with nothing to do um, other than either read medieval Italian literature or doom scroll. I spent quite a bit of time doom scrolling and uh, I was sort of running out of content, so to speak. <laughs> so so one of the things that, um, you know, I started scraping the bottom of the barrel and somewhere at the bottom of my own watching habits barrel is Adam and Sitch clips, which I, not, I don't really watch them anymore, but, you know, I was really reaching for it at this stage. So I am... Um, I, 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 I flip it open and I look at their Clips channel. And strangely enough, they have an interesting show um, on The Amazing Atheist. Like The Amazing Atheist literally comes in. And this is funny because The, the Amazing... I mean, people don't know this, but uh, I did a response. Like one of the first videos I ever did on my channel that was actually a response video to a major content creator was a response video to The Amazing Atheist about the nature of objective morality which is sort of a big thing back then. And The Amazing Atheist actually did a response to me on his, well, I think his podcast, it was called The Drunken Peasants Podcast back in the day, which is, you know, for, for a YouTube creator that had less than a thousand subscribers, that was a big break for me. So I was like, oh my God. You know, but this was one of, this was one of the, the people that uh, I was considering one of my big adversaries back in two, the summer of 2016, which strangely enough, I was, I was back in California during that time period. But, but long story short, this is a content creator that really defined my early career watching YouTube and making YouTube videos. But then somewhere around the 2017 point, I just completely lost interest in him because the guy had nothing interesting to say. He was caught in the limbo between being a progressive shill and being an anti shw shill. And, and neither of his perspectives were interesting. Uh, but... But the, uh, you know, I was, I was vaguely aware that he hadn't completely gone away. I mean, this was one of the biggest YouTubers back in the day. I mean, along with there with Thunderfoot and, and the other atheist YouTubers, this was, I mean, for, for political YouTube prior to 2018, this was, he was a big deal. And, uh, okay, so he's showing up on Adam and Sitch. And, of course, Adam and Sitch sort of being the internet dialectic police have called him to the floor to answer all of, uh, I guess he's really gotten the business of, of becoming a progressive shill. Uh, and that makes sense, right? He got back into making videos properly, it seems, around 2020. And that was during the big left-wing bread tube resurgence, which, which seems at this point to be in the process of completely dying out. But at any rate, he made a number of statements about how all Republicans are just demons, uh, they, they all they want to do is control women's bodies. They want to bring back slavery. They want to lie about the truth, and they want to they want and they, they want to use media disinformation to to accomplish all of this. And TJ's really big idea that sort of famously got pushed back a few months ago was that we we're going to have we're, he 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 got he 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 cracked the code, guys. All we need to do is have the government establish a department called the Department of Truth. I think he called it the Department of Facts. And this department will just determine everything that's true, and then everything that's true you can talk about, and everything that's false you can't talk about. Otherwise, they'll send you to jail for saying false things. 
the, the government will determine all of this. This is this is the big brain atheist idea. This is what a big brain atheist idea sounds like in 2021. Uh, this is balls to the wall insane, and it, it's sort of it's 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 bizarre. And this is part of the reason why he got on Adam and Sitch to explain this this uh, you know absolutely astoundingly insightful idea. But it, it, what it belies is just this complete ignorance of the dialectic, uh, the the complete ignorance of of, of how the the enlightenment principles themselves work this is is sort of a funny thing because it, it he's he like steven pinker and all the other new atheist people they're they're big enlightenment bros right they're big enlightenment bros but he doesn't know how the enlightenment works and this is this is sort of funny i mean i guess the enlightenment is just uh, this is just when they stop being wrong and the proxy for not being wrong is not believing in god or whatnot he doesn't understand the, the very basic idea that open dialectics outside of a central central control is the was, was at least at least classically understood was the fundamental epistemological tool for determining truth. It was supposed to be a free dialectic, an open discourse where you could obtain truth or figure out what was right or wrong based on what was appealing to, to you as an intellectual, as an independent thinker, as somebody who had firm control over his conscience. This is a very Protestant idea. <clears throat> and and somehow you know, somehow TJ Kirk, he he's completely unaware of how this works. He's completely unaware that as, the soon, as soon as government gets this power, the immediate temptation will be to call their political enemies liars. And since they're the ultimate arbiter of truth under the provision of objectivity, this will naturally be abused. Moreover, even if you can completely rule out some kind of maleficent intentional abuse on the part of governments who want to maintain their own power, you still have to deal with the fact that there will be good faith errors where people will be will have legal force brought against them for being on the wrong side of some kind of scientific controversy that comes that that comes out the opposite way that the, the establishment thinks is 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 the right way even even a sincerely believed uh, conviction that 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 their view is the right way. And it's so funny because this this is this is their classic example always with Galileo. This is their classic example with the Ga Galileo's decision that he needed to stand on the idea that the Earth revolved around the Sun because it allowed the star maps to move in a more sensical pattern. And, and you know, of course, TJ is completely unaware that, that this, the even Galileo was part of a scientific debate, and there was. Tons at the, that point, there was tons of evidence on both sides of the heliocentric and geocentric debate, and and it, it didn't hurt the the geocentrists that their the entire understanding of physics supported their model of how the universe actually operated. And there's no understanding of this, and um, and, and there's no there's, and then somehow, at least in the Adam and Sitch podcast, um. The conversation goes to Republicans because this is this is the second thing the the the, the Adams big thing of straw manning, which is kind of ironic considering our own conversation, which it seemed like they couldn't stop uh, misrepresenting the right wing ideas. <laughs> it felt like they didn't need to do this, but the the next the next subject of the conversation was right wingers, and of course. Uh, TJ is is out uh, out in front of the the other speakers about how Republicans are they just want to control people's bodies they they just want to have a theocracy and they want to bring back slavery right because that's the the only reason why they want to to actually um to actually uh, <coughs> uh, save statues from being demolished or want to have any kind of uh, non woke history that's not derived from the 1619 project. These, this is just a fascination with their eventual goal of enslaving black people again. Uh, and no, and no, he's not just saying this because he thinks it. No, he has this on good authority um, because he lives in the South and he talks to Southern Republicans all the time and they always tell him that they want to bring back slavery. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why anyone said this, but I'm pretty sure this is an absolute lie. Uh, T.J. Kirk was born in California. 
I understand that he lived part of his childhood in the South. But I remember very distinctly, because I was in these cities myself, that at least when he was making videos back in 2016 or 2018, he was living in like Portland and then later Seattle, I believe. He was not an author that was based out of Alabama or Georgia. I mean, did, what did he did he move? Did he buy a house in Seattle and then move back? And then not only did he move back to Alabama or Savannah, Georgia, he immediately took up to you know attending Klan rallies and then quizzing people on their beliefs about their desire to bring back slavery. Um, this is this is absolute. I mean, I don't know that the. the the, the track that Adam and Sitch took was was that you're being uncharitable. Uh, I, I think TJ was just flat out lying. And, and of course, every time a Republican is uh, is is mentioned, uh, TJ launches into this this really precious performance where he sort of sounds like Macho Man Randy Savage. He's like, I want this, I want this, I want that. Like he's doing some kind of Jeff Foxworthy or Larry the Cable Guy <laughs> impression of a redneck, and and this is this is supposed to be like the hypothetical Republican saying all of this, being picked up by the keen ears of T.J. Kirk, who's just tuned into their their secret conspiracy to bring back slavery to and, and refight the Civil War in 2024. Uh, I guess January 6th was their attempt to do just that. Um, and it, what's what's so funny is that I'm I initially I was just listening to this and then halfway through uh, me me watching this or listening to because I was like on the bed, fever of 100 and 203, listening to this this uh, audio playback, and um, and uh, I I decided to at the end of it I'm like okay what where what's the reaction I know I'm and such don't don't have their eyes showing on camera. I guess Adam has his face, but his sunglasses. I gotta see. Like, is there some kind of reaction? Like, is there a jaw drop here? And and I and I I, I turn on uh, the the video, and T.J. Kirk has his entire face like painted like a troll, and this this like he, like he's some kind of swamp creature. Like he's like he's some kind of troglodyte that crawled out of a bayou. <laughs> And and you know he has this, he has this like Rob Zombie beard that's devoured his entire face. I'm sure he was thinking uh, of Rob Zombie when he was doing this because I mean I know he's a big like I don't think Rob Zombie was new metal, but I know he's a big like Marilyn Manson person from the late '90s, very much that type. And uh, <laughs> I mean he, he looks like just the kind of ignoramus stereotype that you cook up. Uh, the uh, the I mean, all you'd have to do is change his politics and dump him into the rural, rural South, and he would be he would be the picture of of his own caricature, his own character caricature of the Republicans. So I, I watched this, and I, I I mean I had to say something about this. I had to say something about how this is this is playing out. Um, but you know, the, about three or four days pass. I'm heading back to. Um, to, to my home on the East Coast or my home away from home on the East Coast, my work home. And uh, a, a new video drops from the from the normie right wing in Britain, the, the guys at Trigonometry. Trigonometry is like a less edgy, more mainstream version of Sargon of Akkad's Lotus Eaters. Uh, and in my opinion, a lot less interesting, although I should say a lot more interview based. I think it's a lot less news commentary and a lot more interviews. And wouldn't you know it, uh, a bad penny just can't help but turn up. Sam Harris is back in the news, uh, back in the news for with his with his own little, uh, I, I guess, attempt to become relevant again. He, he was he was briefly trying to make a comeback for himself with a show uh, where where he was going to take on the Wokies, uh, and then I think it kind of got devoured into the whole. Trump derangement syndrome as we got closer and closer to the elections in 2020. The last I heard of him, I think, was sometime in uh, August or September 2020, just before the election. And then he fell off the earth again, as far as I'm concerned. But now he's, you know, he's reemerged and he's come on this podcast about uh, about you know, pushing back against the radical left. <coughs> and um, I mean, just it's it's the same story this person has learned absolutely nothing this is it's kind of it's kind of funny i mean he 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 looks kind of like the 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 actor mark ruffalo 
uh, from from the Incredible Hulk series, except you know worse for wear significantly than when he was appearing uh, on on the podcast in two thousand and six. And it wasn't really supposed to be about this, but he immediately launches into uh, a, a, a an explanation about about Trump and the decision to censor Trump on Twitter. And then on top of that, the decision of Twitter and Facebook and the New York Times, and all mainstream media outlets, to censor the Hunter, Hunter Biden laptop story. Uh, and in this interview, which is so funny because the guests, the 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 broadcasters, they they're so sympathetic to Harris. They're atheists. They obviously were disciples of Harris before that. They obviously were people who who came up from that milieu themselves. They so desperately want to talk about wokeism and pushing back against the insane left and how is this going to play out now that Trump's no longer president. But so they, just doesn't want, they just want to touch on the whole social media censorship thing. But Sam Harris keeps on refocusing the conversation. Every time it moves away, he kind of subtly, uh, kind of subtly steers steers the conversation back onto the flaming pile of of turds and decides to dig his grave three feet deeper so his initial opinion is is that um trump should have been censored uh, even though he apparently to my knowledge to this point had no criminal reason for him being censored uh during january 6th and that's because he presented some kind of he was he was an existential threat to the existence of life on this planet and, and you know every time they ask for an explanation as to the standards of why trump was censored sam harris doesn't he he doesn't give an explanation as to the logic he doesn't say well he crossed this line and this line was this this and this and you, know, you have to make be sure not to do x y and z when you're a, a public elected official and you know here's my criterion all he does is continuously uh, kind of create these little listicles about trump is worse than cancer trump is worse than you know nuclear war there's never been a person stupider than trump uh, any random person could be better than trump on you as an office <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> the, uh, the 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 conclusion of this, pardon me, I need a drink of water. <clears throat> the conclusion of this is that Sam Harris really does not have an explanation about why Trump should be censored, other than he does not match the friend enemy distinction. He also doesn't have an explanation over why it was correct for the New York Times and Twitter and Facebook to center factual information about Hunter Biden's laptop, other than it was the wrong political team. He even at one point says like it was a left wing conspiracy to go get this stuff. To, 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 you know, it was left wing. I, I'm very comfortable. I'm very comfortable, guys, with a left wing conspiracy to to make sure that damaging information does not uh, you know result in in, in, a, in a cataclysmic effect to our democracy and, and end everything we know is good and true. And of course, as soon as he says that, people are, like, are you really Sam, you really believe that? Oh no no no, I I don't believe it. There's no left wing conspiracy. And <clears throat> what sort of I think you know, I think when if you've watched people inside. Uh, sort of the the previous progressive establishment, the moderate left of 2006 fame, uh, when all this new atheist stuff comes out, you're you're, you're sort of aware of this dance. <clears throat> the dance is sort of to simultaneously get on message. <clears throat> Excuse me, that might be a little bit of the uh, <laughs> virus, but um, the 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 point the this the the dance is to simultaneously get on message. And, uh, to, to push the narrative you know has to be pushed because all of the major establishment institutions support this narrative. Uh, but at the same time, you have to you have to present it like you're working through it. Like this is an open discourse. Like this is, we're participating, we're, we're freely reasoning and coming to these conclusions organically, following the process of dialectics set out by people like John, or I mean, John Locke didn't advertise this, but if you think of someone like Rawls or John Stuart Mill, we're, 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 we're freely thinking and, and going over all this information like public intellectuals should. So there's a certain, and Sam Harris, this is, I think, why it was such a bombshell for Sam Harris, because there's this, Sam Harris perfectly embodies in his style 
he perfectly embodies this this dialectic, this this aesthetic image of the public intellectual working through it. Uh, his cadence is very calm and methodical, and 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 communicates that he's actually considering all these points. But the problem is there's there's absolutely no organic non ideological way to to get to his position. So so all he, all he can do <clears throat> is is rehearse in sort of this very intellectual professorial cadence this absolutely ideal this absolute pile of ideological bullshit that that everyone can smell from three miles away that the, the hosts are just kind of staring at it <laughs> kind of kind of astounded at this this leap of logic and then then at the last mo- moment hop on to some kind of emotional appeal to friend enemy distinction you know trump is a meteor heading towards earth and you know your bruce willis uh, slamming into it with a nuclear weapon as aerosmith plays in the background you remember that's sort of a 90s reference but but everyone can remember that really saccharine movie, uh, the Joel Schumacher extravaganza Armageddon, uh, with the, with a, the, Sam Harris uses the image of the meteor crashing into Earth. So, and uh, I, I can always imagine Sam Harris crashing his reputation into Donald Trump, which is pretty much what he did. And um, uh, this, I don't know what there is to say because he keeps on digging himself further and further into the hole. He says that uh, by the end of it, he's saying he didn't doesn't care. He doesn't care if 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 Hunter Biden was literally murdering children. It would be nothing approaching the corruption of Trump University, which is I don't know. It's some scam that's associated with Trump's name. Whether or not Trump actually participated in it, it's pretty minor. It would be you know more or less equivalent to the Clinton's Whitewater scandal that erupted before their presidency that no one remembers these days. Uh, but Sam Harris, no, that's that's. Hunter Biden murdering children would, wouldn't be as bad as that. And the important thing is to taking steps to preventing the absolute collapse of the Enlightenment democracy that we hold so dear. And it comes to light a few things. The first thing is that the reason why Sam Harris believes that Trump is so bad uh, and, and you know worse than a random ignoramus, and this is what was really interesting, it, it sort of indicated a little bit more self-awareness than even Sam Harris was letting on, and, and Sam Harris is of nothing but, but kind of almost embarrassingly honest in this interview. The 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 message he, he says he says to the he says to the hosts the, the reason why a random ignoramus would be better than Trump is that a random ignoramus could be bullied by the expert consensus to doing what the institutional establishment wanted, and Trump would could defy the expert consensus and go against the institutional apparatus of the American government. And also the media and academia. I mean, he almost, as Aaron McIntyre said in his podcast with Alex Kashuda, he almost just names the cathedral and says, oh, yeah, Trump was a danger to the cathedral. And that's why this had to happen, because the only way that the Enlightenment project works, and I think, you know, Sam Harris might subconsciously realize this, the, the only way that some kind of neutral dialectic, the reason why it feels good for him is he knows that there's an expert consensus hiding behind the discourse, hiding behind how information proceeds through the apparatus of government and, and quasi-government institutions like media and university systems. He, he knows ahead of time that this ideology is dominant in those sectors. So, so insofar, at the same time as he has to defend his belief in the Enlightenment principle of open discourse, he also has to defend the institutions because if the institutions go down, or someone disestablishes them uh, radically in their prominence, uh, then all of a sudden discourse becomes a lot more scary. All of a sudden, you kind of move off the rails that, that you're on, and and you're you, you the the whole I should say this that and you know there's a tweet that 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 sort of reminded me about this too. The whole conversation that Sam Harris is ready to have is a dialectic that is on rails. It is like going through the jungle cruise. It's not like an actual safari where you could go here or there or you could check out this water hole and you're actually viewing wild animals. The, that's That would be open discourse and almost no one wants to participate in that. Or, I mean, maybe a few very cu- curious individuals like that, but it is very much an extreme sport. But ordinary consumers of politics don't like that because it's it's scary. It has all sorts of... Of, of socially unacceptable conclusions that could arise from, from that experiment. So Sam, Sam Harris, 
and really everyone he represents, wants to have this conversation that's on this sort of set of ideological institutional rails that carries you through. You'll, you'll see the tiger from a distance, right? But the tiger is physically incapable of actually interacting with you. It, it's, it's mounted on an animatronic stand and it's, and it's being controlled. It can't actually go up to your car. It can't actually break your windows. You're not going to have to get out a gun and shoot it. Um, you're, you're, but, and then you're going to wheel, you're going to get wheeled through. And then the end, you're going to end up in the concession stand and you're going to buy a gift from the gift shop and you're going to go home and you're going to be, you know, a center left rationalist atheist, uh, just like everyone in the ruling class thinks is the ideal place to be. And you can see this in certain places. Uh, just the other day, Mark Hamill, uh, t he retweeted this piece of misinformation about supposedly this list of banned books from, from Florida schools. And you look at this list of banned books, it's like The Catcher in the Rye, like Lord of the Rings, Harry Potter, 1984, Brave New World, Huck Finn, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, The Color Purple, and, you know, uh, the Great Gatsby. And you're looking at this list. I mean, this list, first of all, I'm, I'm well aware of the conversations about school board book choices in red states. I've been watching those debates. And they certainly aren't targeting Huck Finn. I'm aware that some people wanted to censor Huck Finn. But Huck Finn uh, was censored because it contains copious uses of the N-word which is more or less a liberal preoccupation. This thing is not getting banned by, by, by a right-wing um, by, by right uh, school boards. But, you know, regardless of that, regardless of this list is obviously fake and these titles aren't actually at risk of, of getting banned, uh, there's a few things you might notice from even the truncated list I gave you here. Uh, the supposedly banned books on this banned book list these are the same titles that appear in the banned books displays at Barnes and Noble, where they're saying, read a banned book this month. Read a banned book. And so it's like Catcher in the Rye, Huckleberry Finn, uh, you know, Harry Potter. These are the banned books. Um, okay, so Harry Potter and Lord of the Rings and Handmaiden's Tale are all multi-million dollar, like extended universe media franchises that are being crammed down our throats by Amazon and Netflix and, and and every other production company in Hollywood, if they can get their hands on the rights to produce content for those universes, uh, these things ain't banned. And then on top of that, I mean, the other books like Catcher in the Rye, The Color Purple, The Grapes of Wrath, uh, that's not the banned book list. That's the assigned reading list for most high schools in this country. And, and so, you know, they're presented as banned. And I got this... I got the gears when we read Catcher in Rye when I was in high school. First of all, Catcher in the Rye, I mean, it's actually a fairly, really fun book if you understand the late 60s. But for people who don't, or the, sorry, the late 50s, but for people who don't understand the beatnik generation or who don't understand the old America and who are reading this in like Bay Area or Bay Area adjacent California, a catcher in the Rye just goes straight over your head. You have no understanding of the world it's critiquing. You have no understanding of the world Holden Caulfield lives in or what his rebellion actually feels like uh, or the establishment he's rebelling against. <clears throat> but but always, and always, the, and the, the way the teachers sell this is, oh, this is a banned book. This is a banned book. Uh, this is a banned book. Uh, well, why is it banned? Oh, it had profanity in it. Okay, great. You know, lots of books had profanity in them in 1950-something. Uh, is, is that why? Does this have some kind of piece of information that, that was really salacious or, or really threatening the worldview of, of, of the, the post-war post America, of the consensus uh, of New York in 1955? Um, no, I know no one can answer that question. But no, it's banned. It's, you're, you're dangerous for reading this book. I'm not. I'm not against Salinger. I think he's a great writer, but it's just, it's to, it's it, you're participating in this pantomime of rebellion that doesn't. It makes absolutely no sense. The entire establishment of California, and in particular California Bay Area, in 1999 or in 2000, uh, this establishment was entirely comprised of people who saw themselves on the side of Holden Caulfield. And his rebellion against the establishment of the early or late 50s. 
uh, that 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 world doesn't exist anymore, and, and so you keep on getting these 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 really phony rebellions, and somewhere in this process. I don't think I really realized this until 2010 almost. You realize that your your whole intellectual journey is on rails. You come to the edge, you, you encounter these alternative worldviews. But by the time you encounter worldviews that you're actually not supposed to accept, A, you don't read them as primary sources, and B, uh, you have someone sitting there explaining to you explicitly why you shouldn't believe this thing and why only evil people believe this thing. It's never actually debated. I don't think I debated an, an actual controversial point my entire stay in college. And I'm a person who really sought it out. I, mean, I guess I did because I, I joined an independent book group that read things like Nietzsche and, and classics. But by the time you, you, if you encounter these things in an institutional setting... Open debate, you know, with the possible exception of Nietzsche himself. I think Nietzsche might be the one exception where, 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 where a genuinely politically incorrect thinker is presented to you as some thinker you might actually accept for yourself. But for the most part, everything else is just, it, it's those rails. These are not real lions. These are not real threats to the liberal world order. You just watch them as you get wheeled through the system. And... And the banned books list and everything else is just is just a component of this. It's like T.J. Kirk's uh, image of the redneck. Uh, everybody has this image of the redneck. Do you, under, I mean, do you understand this? Like T.J. Kirk's, a big part of his shtick is doing the ma Macho Man Randy Savage meets Jeff Foxworthy voice and then presenting that as your typical Republican. That's a part of his shtick that he uses to sell the Amazing Atheist Act. Um, this, I, I, according to TJ's biography, he actually encountered people like this because he lived in the South as a child. And I always believed that until I heard the, what sounded like the whopper that, that he, he, he currently lived in the South after living in, you know, blue America, he came back to the South and, and, and regularly attended apparently clan meetings. Uh, after that, I'm doubting that he even encountered this as a child growing up in the South, but then you also hear this story coming from people like Sam Harris and Vosh and Hassan Piker. All of these people, actually, they came from the same, they all came from Beverly Hills. They all grew up in Beverly Hills, California. They weren't encountering Bayou Boy in Beverly Hills, California. They had, they had this image drilled into their head. And I, I remember hearing, you know, everyone had a story about like a redneck in the Bush years, right? Like especially after 2000, I was still in high school. People hated Bush. And the, the, the story always was like, oh, you know, I have, Bush reminds me of my redneck uncle. You know, we were all California kids. Very few people had, you know, were, were raised by people in trailer parks in this community. So we had like, there, apparently people had like, weird uncles that came to Thanksgiving that were like this. And of course it was all played up to effect. And with Bush in the white house, you know, Bush obviously comes from a patrician New York family, but his, his Texas affectation that he rolled out during the election years, mm -hmm. uh, using that, it was possible to believe that we really, we really lived in, in a, in an autocracy of rednecks and that our, our blue state sensibilities were rebellion against that. How were we able to maintain this illusion? Uh, by by the end of the by the end of the the Sam Harris interview, uh, it, it's funny he moves on from talking to, about Trump and he starts talking about other views on things. He starts saying things about religion. He 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 informs the hosts at one point, and you can see their incredulity growing on their faces. He informs his hosts at one point that we know heaven doesn't exist because we have telescopes that can see heaven. And again, to quote Aaron McIntyre, since our telescopes haven't, you know, seen, <laughs> haven't peered into Jesus's apartment complex and caught him taking a shower, uh, that means go that God don't reel <laughs> and the atheism is proven. And, and he, 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 he lists this off, um, again, with his sort of professorial cadence, with this big dopey grin on his face. And 
it's almost like I mean, you know, and, and you know, Aaron. I I don't want to quote Aaron McIntyre, but this is he he said the exact same thing that I was thinking himself. I know for a fact Sam Harris has debated against practice theologians. He knows that this isn't the argument. This is not a steel man of Christian theology. Like at any point in Christian history, maybe Dante obviously believed that heaven was comprised of the spheres of the planets. Uh, but but even in Dante's time, you you have people talking about a more metaphysical heaven that was not connected to the actual orbits of of the physical heavens themselves. And and this is and so Sam Harris is just repeating this like he's somehow demolished Christianity. Like and he's expecting I don't know the hosts to high five him. But instead of that, like they get they get the next question about oh you know is this are, are we sure that our atheism are, should we should we we be so confident in our atheism these days? You know, they they bring up J.K. Chesterton about how getting rid of religion is is uh, is an invitation for other irrationalities to come to the fore, and uh, you know they, they're obviously tempting or offering Sam Harris a much deeper conversation, a sort of Jordan Peterson conversation, that I think everyone who takes Sam Harris seriously as a thinker is really dying of him, they're really dying for him to address this, given that he was one of the primary people that was there before, uh, before uh, well, he was one of the primary old new atheists, or one of the primary new atheists, four horsemen new atheists, that, that later came out against wokeness explicitly. Everyone's really waiting for him to address the fact that wokeness is not going anywhere, that, that this has become an, an irre, irre, irrevocable feature of the very institutions, of the very elite consensus that Sam Harris is desperate to preserve. And that, so they ask him, okay, so what's the solution to this? How are we going to address wokeness? It's almost like wokeness has hijacked humanity's religious instinct and is essentially filling it with political ideology that's a thousand, thousand times worse. And Sam Harris's reaction is, oh, no, wokeness is just going to go away. It's going to just disappear like a magical vapor. And in, in five years, it will never occur again. It's like the satanic panic, guys. Uh, for those of you who aren't aware, the satanic panic was... You know, a brief period in the 1980s where a variety of sort of rural, rural communities were seized by an obsession with satanic child abuse occurring, I think, mostly among teachers. And there were a bunch of psychologists that got sort of false memories recovered from from uh, from from kids by by sort of interrogating them and giving them leading questions. Uh, and you got all these crazy stories about teachers conducting satanic rituals inside classrooms, which, given what we've seen coming from the lips of TikTok these days, doesn't seem as far fetched as I'd like to say it. What did in 1999? But this was this was a staple example of, of the new atheists because it, it, it was it was part of the presentation that without the the firm guidance of the new atheist hand, we would all be going back to cargo cultism and. Uh, and, and you know, sacrificing to Baal or to sending our kids to Jesus camp and losing all touch with, with a really um, steely-eyed, firm look at reality and, and the scientific facts that we need to have in front of us. <clears throat> um, this is <laughs> this this I, I, once once you heard sort of the the we have telescopes, so why can't we see heaven? Followed quickly by. Wokeness is going to disappear because magic, magic vapors. Uh, you you could kind of feel the entirety of the new atheist worldview kind of just give this dying groan, the the, the all of the gas kind of escaping from it uh, immediately. And I I don't know if this was. I guess if people say that Sam Harris said the quiet part loud. Um, he's he's basically showing people what new atheism was, what what it, the actual purpose of new atheism was, the actual purpose of new atheism, what what it the role it played for my generation and for 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 a certain number, and the, the, really actually it's the same role that Vosh and Hassan Piker play uh, for for the current Zoomer generation. The role new atheism played for my generation was to convince us 
that we were smarter than all previous generations of humans, that sort of the traditional modes, the traditional morality uh, that would say place constraints on the behavior we wanted to have as 20 something young guys, all of those constraints were stupid and ridiculous and didn't need to be looked into. And, and simply by using our own common sense uh, and really, you know, really what we were doing was following along this, this dialectic path on rails, going through the institutional ride uh, of, of college and then, and then post-college professional existence. If we just used our common sense and followed the dotted lines that were laid out before us, uh, we would be saving the world. We would be putting superstition in its place. We would be progressing. We were on the right side of history. In, in reality, what we were being offered was, was what I call a pornography, pot, and pedantry. Obviously, pornography and pot are, are just self-explanatory. There's just the self-indulgence that all young men want to do, and that all men secretly in their heart of hearts know is, is self-destructive. And then you have pedantry, which was the essential component that the, these, these ideologies allowed us to participate in, which was to think that by participating in, in really rather midwit thinking, we were smarter than all of the great thinkers that had gone before us. We were the people who were standing on top of it all, looking down on everyone else. We could invert the great historical question. We could move the question from what would history think of us to what do we think of history, which is obviously a much more comfortable question to be thinking about when you're smoking pot than the reverse, because the reverse question is obvious and, and threatening to your actual uh, self-indulgent lifestyle. The title of this uh, talk, and I mean, it's obviously not my most original intro to any of these things, is, is the loud part quiet. Uh, the, the loud part quiet is what's really going on. The, the loud part quiet is what Sam Harris's job is. It's to, it's, to, it's to take the most interesting parts of the conversation and to tactically not have them while seeming like he's having the most interesting conversation he could be having. What's the most interesting, loud part of the conversation about Trump and censorship, either through the Hunter Biden laptop story or through his censorship from Twitter? The most interesting thing, the loudest part of that conversation is who rules us and who controls information? That's the loud part. It's not whether Trump was bad or how bad Trump was or whether he'd be worse than a random person. The point of the conversation here, how do decisions actually get made in this society? How does the democratic process actually get fed information? And who steal, who actually creates the rare, the rails that steer the conversation on what is obviously a predetermined conclusion? Sam Harris and the New York Times and Twitter and Facebook knew exactly how they wanted the dialectic to move, going from 2017 to 2020. And they just moved it on that path. And there could be no larger conversation because they systematically engaged in disinformation campaigns to slow drip out all of the information that would lead to any kind of narrative contradiction of the path that they had predetermined. The loud part, the part that immediately screams at you when you're just plain looking at the news as it's coming into your vision, as it's coming into your as it's coming into your worldview, is it, it, the, the, that, that's the loud part. That's the part that we're being asked to ignore. It's impossible not to ignore at this stage. Just as if, if we were actually going through high school or college with our eyes open, if, if, we, didn't, if we got the macho man Randy Savage and, and the Bayou Boy caricatures of the Republicans out of our imaginations, and we as rebellious young children actually looked at who ruled us, like Colin Caulfield. I mean, this is actually something that's interesting, and it, I, I'm glad I'm actually able to say something good about Catcher and the Rye because I actually do like the book. Um, what's the difference between Holden Caulfield's rebellion? You know, we all read Catcher and the Rye in high school, right? Uh, what's the difference between Holden Caulfield's rebellion in high school and my rebellion in high school? Holden Caulfield is actually rebelling against the people who are telling him what to do in his life. Whereas my rebellion in high school 
was all rebellions against people who were hypothetically telling me how to think. These, these weren't the actual people who were telling me how to think. I, mean, I got into some conflicts with my, my, my teachers back then, but if I had actually looked at the people who were controlling how we were having our conversations, what was right and wrong to say, what was polite and what was not polite, uh, who were trying to actually direct us and, and steer us down certain areas, which is a little bit less apparent in, in the year 2001 or 2002, much more apparent now. If you, if you were to actually look at those people, the, the people who filled the roles of the people that Holden Caulfield rebelled against in Catcher on the Rye, you wouldn't see Bayou Boy or Macho Man Randy Savage. You'd see a series of boomer women who were really controlling institutions that steered information processing and filling institutions with people who would who would buttress them. And so our, that was sort of that was that was what we were that's what we should have actually looked at. That's those the constraints that we should have bucked against. Uh, but we didn't. We didn't, and and if you go outside these days, <clears throat> if you just interact with people post COVID, and I believe me, I, I'd like to, I'd like to have come to you this week with more stories about actually doing that. Uh, but just going through, you know, the grocery stores or or interacting with people in the hallways of your apartment complex, uh, the the loud part is that we are obviously in a dying society. Uh, and there's nothing we can really do to stop it, but but our entire social apparatus that was so visible before has completely fallen through, and people deal with each other almost entirely transactionally. We we exist in our own little filter bubbles, and that's all that remains. And there, the 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 main political distinctions that we have to fight at this stage of our development are questions about whether we go further into this bubble or whether we pop out of it. Where we want, where, Do we want to embrace true human existences? Do we want to actually have conversations about controversial topics? Or is everything going to be filtered through institutions? Are people just going to be objects that are cared for in a variety of ways? Uh, you know, I think the, the girls over at Red Scare, I think, was that they, they had this interesting tweet I hate talking about tweets on the podcast because, oh, I guess oh, what was I doing for ten days while I was I was I was sick? I was, I was scrolling social media, but they said an interesting thing: the establishment likes sick, they don't like dead, and they don't like healthy because they can't control dead or healthy, but they can control sick. Once you're sick, once you're contagious, once you're incapacitated, they can tell you exactly what to go, where to go, what to do, what to say, how to think. And of course, since it's an emergency, exactly what is and what isn't disinformation. You're a complete component of the managerial state at that stage. That's the loud part. But somehow in Sam Harris's dialogue, it's all quiet. That's, a, like, that's an irrelevant feature of this conversation. I mean, what's more relevant to Sam Harris, intelligent design or the fact that Charles Murray was censored for, I think, accurately talking about an open scientific controversy concerning statistical group differences? What's more relevant to how we're actually governing our societies? But of course, no, the loud part has to be said quiet. The loud part has to be said quiet. We don't actually live our lives. We live them as proxies for institutions. Oh, our job is not to think about solutions. Our job is just to get on the, the ride where we demand solutions, and the solutions are always that of the bureaucracy. Um, I don't know. I think that that's, what you, that's what you see. Inside, inside the Sam Harris worldview, that's what you're getting. That I think it's impossible to ignore this anymore. I, I, I know that the trigonometry people at one point said that they wanted to rescue leftism from this process, but there's there's no rescuing it. The the only way because because leftism is the direction that the establishment wants to go, the only way that that anything new can come about is that leftism as we've known it for the last 300 years has to end. The concept of progressive history has to end. Any 
motion we take, even if it, even if leftists might like it, will have to be perceived as not an element of progress, but as a decision that emerges organically from an actual person in an actual power structure making an actual decision with our actual with our, with the actual limited amount of information he has to make with his flawed and corrupted soul he has as a human being. That's what has to actually uh, be replace liberalism, and, and it will destroy. It. it has to destroy it, because if this, if if the same decision is seen as some kind of mechanical emanation from either a force of progress or an expert consensus or some kind of inevitable consequence of education itself. All we're doing is repeating the machine that has entrapped us in the same bureaucracy of experts. And, th and that frequently actually generates misinformation, generates false facts, as long as it preserves the narrative of its own existence, as Sam Francis has openly admitted to. Sam Francis has made this impossible to ignore. He's made the decision we have going forward impossible not to take seriously. I don't know how, I mean, I don't know. I, I guess we know how this is dealt with. We know how this is dealt with. It's dealt with the way that Bosch and Hassan Piker deal with it. It's dealt with that you just create a, a rhetorical bubble that preserves people's core identities inside a political narrative. And the only thing you allow into this bubble are conversations that are held inside the friend-enemy distinction lens. And since everything is friend-enemy distinction, people excuse your rhetorical tricks like ad hominems and Martin Bailey tactics. And as Poe the Person pointed out recently, uh, teacup fallacies. That's where you, you, you list an a number of contradictory objections to your opponent's uh, perspectives. And you, you don't care that they contradict each other. You know that one will land. And uh, it's all you ultimately need. That's eventually how you, you deal with this problem. You deal with this through the transgender movement, with the, the transgender egregore, as I think Kofi Annan on Twitter calls it. Uh, everyone has something to lose if this worldview goes down. So no one can question the collective consciousness, the collective narrative. And everything else that enters into that event horizon, the only thing that matters after that event horizon is friend-enemy, is Schmidtian politics. It's the only thing that emerges from that, from that perspective. Friend-enemy and the question of quality, uh, the quality to the cause of the group. Oftentimes, I think this is what we really miss, is that, is that we, we actually have a monopoly on open conversation. Uh, the kind of affectation that Sam Francis is, is acting out in his, in his interview, the, the calm cadence of the university professor, he can take the form, but we're the only people, the right wing or the distance, the distant left wing, I guess when I said the distant left, I mean like people like Red Scare or Caleb Maupin, uh, you know, the, the tankies, as they're called, the people who want to break with neoliberalism in a fundamental way. That they're the only ones that can have open conversations because they're the only ones who aren't invested institutionally in the lies, institutionally in covering up what the biggest problems are in our world. I mean, I know I'm, I'm about to close it out here, but... I mean, the biggest problem we're staring down right now is eternal economic catastrophe. I, I know it's really scary to think about this, but there, there are two... November is going to be a big, big month for politics. Right now, everyone... I mean, it's August. Everyone in Europe is on vacation. I had my aborted 10-day vacation that was mainly me being sick. <laughs> uh, and... But once people get back to reality and the midterms are over, the energy crisis begins in earnest. Winter happens in Europe. Winter happens in America. Questions over renewable energies and the decisions we've made to make it harder to create food using nitrogen-based fertilizers or things we've done that made it harder 
to actually get natural gas are going to become huge issues for the West, and they're going to cause cascading economic problems. The first question we have in November is, can Republicans win? The second question we have in, in, in November is, how do we deal with the food and energy crisis that obviously is on the horizon? And that's an open question. That's, that's what's sort of screaming down at me right now. I don't know the answer to this. I don't think anyone rightly does. Uh, but we, do know, we do know that we can, we can see the rails, right? We can see that the conversation that the cathedral wants us to have over this co- topic, they want us to have a conversation about how Republicans are holding back clean energy and how Putin is screwing over Europe. And that's, that's the only narrative forum they can embrace. It's the only framework they can actually take on this problem. If they're really stupid and they fortify this election and Democrats maintain power, I, I don't know how the narrative really survives winter. I, I think that uh, we, we, you're going to see, I think it will, it will absolutely kill bread tube. I mean, to the extent that it still exists, economic questions are going to become prominent in a way that they just haven't been before for a large number of people. But behind those economic questions are the framework we can even talk about anything anymore. Uh, you can't divorce these from culture war issues because thanks to climate change predominantly, uh, climate change or uh, culture war issues are, um, economic issues are culture war issues. So it'll be interesting to see. I mean, I, I, one thing that kind of gives me hope in all of this is the fact that the, the right wing or the distant side are the only people that can actually have conversations that are open and, and that, 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 that are not just closely curated. And I think that that kind of um, uh, is, 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 is going to be hopeful. I mean, I, people say... Oh, I can see someone in the chat talk saying, "Oh, well, you think bread tube is going to die the same way that Sam Harris thinks that social justice or or, or wokeism is going to die like a magical vapor?" Uh, look, it's not going to die. Die. Oh, what's going to happen is that it's going to lose. It's going to start rotting. It's going to start rotting from the head down. This is what people don't understand about institutional failure, is that. Um, is that it rots from the head down, and that any 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 form of restoration has to be top down, and any form of real rot comes in from the head down. Anyone who's been reading conservative publications for any length of time knows this argument. Conservatives have more children, and moreover, as we all know from statistics, political view is highly correlated to actual. Uh, to actual political belief as an adult. So, you know, statistically, if you come from a conservative family, uh, you, you will, like, 80% of the time be conservative yourself. And the same thing is true for progressives. I think they have a little bit higher retention rate. But post-Generation X, their birth rate is just floored. They basically just don't reproduce at all. So the conservatives have been saying this for 20 years. Oh, the future belongs to us. The evangelicals in particular said this. The future belongs to us because we have all the children and we'll eventually take over. What was obvious to me in the 2000s and what was not obvious to your average British era Republican like Mark Stein was that, sure, you go to an evangelical school. I think there are some in the South, right? Like Catholic schools, but Protestant. Sure, like... 90% 90% of the graduating class is not going to be progressive. They'll either be apathetic or they'll be conservative. Probably mostly apathetic. Um, but the 10% that convert to progressivism, those students are all the top students in that they're all the elites. They're all the people with the top grades. Everyone who went to flagship schools, everyone who went to Ivy League from the evangelical schools they they were the ones who became feminists and and urban urbanites and urban progressives urban shit libs of the 2000s and so evangelicalism started rotting from the head down it had no ability 
to maintain an elite tradition. All it had was sort of an endless number of people who wanted sort of minimum effort politics. But minimum effort politics was, was called for was called for as a deep engagement with the problem of modernity in a way that you didn't see until the emergence of Jordan Peterson. Jordan Peterson was really Protestant America seeing the long return of its prodigal brain. Jordan Peterson was essentially a, 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 a kind of agnostic version of what would, in, in previous eras of American politics, bring a mainstream Protestant intellectual preacher. He was the peop- he was the very person. I know he's Canadian, right? But he he was the person that in the American the type of person that in the American context would have gone to Harvard and Yale and and then taught at some kind of prestige high school. He was the 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 pre sixties person who would have been Holden Caulfield's enemy and catcher on the rye, who would have told him that life is a game and you need to pull yourself out by your bootstraps, Bucko. Shoved into the corner for thirty years, he emerges out later, and is only then recognized in two thousand and seventeen as someone who conceivably be part of a Republican coalition, part of a non cathedral based perspective on the world. Uh, but that's that's uh, th- that was it. That was that was that's when that's when the fish stopped rotting from the head. Uh, in 2017, uh, the conservative fish stopped having its brain rot, and 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 conceivably could grow some somewhere. And, and post Gamergate, a similar process happened. Progressives are still growing because it's the easiest thing to be. It's the, it's the perspective of the establishment. There are an endless number of people. The reason why The Amazing Atheist is still a thing is there's always more 14-year-olds. And he perfectly represents what a 14-year-old wants to hear. Your enemies are ontologically evil. You don't need to read older people or consider historical perspectives. Religion is stupid. And pot, pornography, and pedantry will get you through life. That's what 14-year-olds want to hear. And what intellectuals or midwits in college want to hear is that you just need to push the progress button harder. You just need to have the right rhetoric. And there's a place for you in the establishment coalition. There's a place for you in the people who are pushing on the right side of history. It, you know, all those other progressives in the previous generations that we all canceled, all those people were white men and they were canceled for reasons uh, you know, they, they aren't the previous iteration of you because they have the wrong opinions. You've got the right opinions now. You're not going to get canceled. Uh, but of course they will. T.J. Kirk was canceled and before he got back in on his knees. And at one point, the Vosh people will be canceled. And the reason why Vosh is growing and T.J. Kirk isn't is that for T.J. Kirk's audience, because of his age more than anything else, it's apparent that you cannot T.J. Kirk your way through life. If you're T.J. Kirk, you're a 40-year-old guy with no kids who looks like Rob Zombie. Um, that's not, I mean, and, and, and who likes being edgy in public. You do that in progressive circles, and they're going to cancel you because you're not T.J. Kirk, and you're not somebody who has a platform, and they don't need you. And your opinions aren't going to save you. And your progressive platitudes aren't going to save you. Vosh fans and Hassan Piker fans, because they're literal communists, they think they've outflanked the left to the left. But they haven't. Because the second the the neo-Leninists of color come on the scene and actually wield power through the cathedral itself... For the people, for the for the people who think that they're Vosh but not Vosh, uh, their immunity to cancellation is going to be cold comfort. And so what we have as a process by which the progressive fish starts rotting from the head. Anyone who thinks hard peels off. Anyone who can think outside of the rails of the experiment. Anyone who can peer through the, 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 the noise put up by the cathedral and hear the screaming reality that's going on around you is eventually going to peel off either to some kind of heretical form of leftism or to some kind of equally heretical version of right-wing ideology, the sum total of human wisdom that existed before our current era of ideological blindness. And, and, and so I think we have the, the dialectics in front of us.
So with that, that's my monologue. I think that was an hour or so. Uh, and uh, now we're in change. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, hopefully, uh, well, the, the enough people, 400 or so people are watching right now. So that's pretty good. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm now ready to take super chats or entropy chats. I believe it's pinned in the description of YouTube. If not, one of the mods can pin it. Uh, now my, I'm probably gonna be looking back and forth between the camera and the and the actual um, and the actual uh, uh, entropy chat thing now. So, uh, oh, okay, a lot of donations so far. Thank you very much, guys. Um, so, as people know, I, I usually try to keep these things between two hours and three hours. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm I'm feeling actually pretty good considering I got over a pretty. Um, a pretty long fever, actually. I mean, I'm not used to being having a fever for like four or five days. It's usually very unusual for me. Um, I know there's a bunch of <laughs> uh, skeptics in the crowd here, but you know, whatever hit me, it, it was it was a it was a bug that that hit hard. It had quite a kick to it, and quite a staying power. Um, you know, all, to be honest, I really want to change tone in podcasts. I didn't want to talk about. So, I mean, I kind of always have to talk about Sam Harris and and uh, and the amazing atheist and 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 where the dialectic is moving. You cannot not talk about the dialectic opposition to you. It, that's that's impossible not to do. Um, but but I, I was hoping to intersperse this more with talk about how to actually live in the real world, how to actually be present, how to actually engage. With sort of visceral politics as it exists in, in your real world. Everyone right now should be thinking about how they're going to be dealing with the politics of the energy crisis, with the politics of the food crisis. Progressives, for progressives, this is a basilisk. They can't look directly at this because to look directly at this uh, is, to, is to kind of go off the rails, even though I'm sure they're going to have some answer for this. I'm sure they're, I, I can't exactly imagine what Bosch is going to say. What was he going to say? We need to build more solar panels. Uh, yeah, but that's kind of exactly what Germany did in the, two, in the, in the oddies to the 2010s. And they are the most screwed people, right? I don't know what Germany is going to do. I, I, I mean, I, our grid is bad enough as it is. Our infrastructure is bad enough as it is. But, but what is Germany going to do? It's, its energy crisis is only just begun. I, I get. I, I imagine what they're going to do is they're going to literally they're going to try to import it um, through the Mediterranean. They're just going to try to ship in natural gas because all of these, all of these places, all of these, uh, um, all, all of these. Usually, all of, I don't know if they still do this anymore, but I got my degree in mechanical engineering. And, and I took a bunch of classes where they, you want to go through like sustainable energy. Um, that's, that's another story from their day about, about me being interested in sustainable energy as, as, as an, a mechanical engineer in the, on the Audis. Uh, and you can kind of see the narrative coming apart at the seams, right? Um, but, but I know that these, these, at least in America, these sustainable energy sources, energy sites are required by law to have natural gas turbines that are ready to fire up and make up excess demand. Some of them, I'm told, even have coal-fired um, auxiliary generators. Uh, so, I, so I imagine what will happen is that they'll fire up these auxiliary coal burners, and they're just going to ship coal and through the, you know, through through the Black Sea, through through the North Sea, and through the um, through the Mediterranean, right? And they're just going to they're just going <laughs> to strong arm their ways out of this and they're going to tank the hypocrisy of the whole endeavor. But there could be a possibility that there, there actually will be people freezing to death in Germany, which is amazing to think about in a modern context. I can't, I can't visualize that. I can't visualize rolling back blackouts in, 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 in winter in, 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 in sub zero temperatures in some areas of Germany. I can't quite imagine that. But I'll, I'll say this, we can talk about that in the distant spheres and they can't in the mainstream. 
Okay, um, so I guess now is the time to go to Super Chats, testing out my fancy new <laughs> non-highlighted uh, Super Chat. Um, uh, one thing I should ask the audience right now, uh, do, do you like the intro music? Do you like the... I know I don't have a new microphone or a soundboard. I'm working on getting all that stuff. But do you like the intro music? Uh, I know it's not Hildegard von Bingen, but it's got to be instrumental. And I'm really tired of the three Hildegard von Bingen instrumental pieces that we have. Not to mention the fact that all of the good instrumental performances we have are all DMCA'd. And it's impossible to find a live performance of that stuff. And I, I really do like the Scottish fiddle music. So um, I, I think I'll keep it for now. Uh, I, I don't know. And, and the American regionalism really goes with it as well, too. Um, oh, and I have, um, I have my book for the poetry reading. I think the poetry reading is going to stay at the end. It's a good wind down. So uh, I don't know. Maybe I'll move it to the beginning again like I did last time. So the first super chat is Catholic Critique of Catholic Culture for $5 USA. A beer, Dave, and a prayer for Ben White. You got this. Uh, is Ben White the super chatter who always calls in with uh, his, his, his latest romantic escapades? Well, I, I don't see him as the first super chatter here, so maybe he, uh, maybe he found his trad waifu and has settled down in, in some, somewhere in Germany. Um, yeah, may, maybe. Uh, I, I imagine cottage core aesthetic might make a little bit of a comeback. Although, although this is always, the thing. I, I deeply distrust, I deeply, deeply distrust uh, traditionalist aesthetics. Uh, I, I, you know, having somebody who made a major Twitter relapse in the last two months, uh, I, I can tell you that Catholic Twitter. I think Bog Beef asked this question. Uh, Catholic Twitter is always raging about the trad cast. Oh, the phony trad cast, the fake trad cast. I think they mean a certain subset of people who like wear chapel veils and go to Latin mass for the aesthetics, but they're they're all new converts. They haven't been doing this for a while. Uh, you know, the, when, when you're in the first two years of your conversion, all of these sort of aesthetic trappings are highly suspect. That's not to say that if you want to commit to that, you shouldn't. You absolutely should. I actually, I absolutely love more traditionalist liturgy, although I'm firmly Novus Ordo. But there's a certain amount of phoniness that comes along with doing this in your first like two years. Uh, it's not yet a habit. It's more just an affectation. In bog beef, uh, you know, one of the uh, one of the hosts of the Good Old Boys podcast was was wondering who everyone is decrying when they decry trad Catholics, and I think it's sort of this this phony new convert uh, Catholic who's mainly online and who does not have a community, who never had a community, who who who's who's all about just jamming the aesthetics, the most traditional aesthetics he possibly can, uh, for the camera on a Twitter feed. And he was not really aware of sort of uh, the hardship of just being an ordinary disciple. Uh, so, well, whatever. Yes. Um, and then, then I might also answer the, uh, the the name Catholic critique of Catholic culture. But, but, but the, the cottage core aesthetic of, of 2018, 2019 had very much the same problem. It very much was an aesthetic movement in search of actual authentic realization. So, um, okay, I have another one from Seasider that just says paid chat message. Uh, I, I assume that's a, uh, a donation, but thank you very much. <clears throat> okay, um, I have to answer this one because it's a super chat. Jonathan Eubank for $5 USA. When Shrek video. Well, as everyone knows, I've, got half of it recorded. And this is a perennial video that I recorded the first half before my son was born. And then the second half never got made and my notes are like this high. Um, periodically, I attempt to just jam it and, and record it and record the last two parts. But I always encounter uh, the, the dual problem is A, unlike regular videos where it's like all in my mind because uh, it's a, a hot controversy. 
I, there's no sort of like passion to do it immediately. So I have to read through notes. And the second thing is I have to do a long recording session uh, like I'm doing right now, but I actually actually had to edit it. And um, man, the amount of time where I've had like a very, very strong voice has been minimal this last year. Uh, it's, um, it's amazing. I've been sick more this year than I have in the last 10 years. I, I honestly can't believe it. I mean, it's part of it's the school's reopening and me having a toddler. Part of it is just that 2022, it's not just me. It's been the worst year for illnesses I've ever witnessed my entire life. I think most people are having very, very similar experiences. All I can say is that I'll, I'll try to just jam it out when I can. <clears throat> Although asking for it's not going to make it happen faster. I really apologize. So Iron Duke 99 for $3 USA. Sam Harris had nothing, nothing whatever to say about the obvious, totally senile Joe Biden. Yeah, I mean, he did kind of mention it, but, but he mentioned it as something he was willing to accept. Being able to start a worldwide nuclear war, just totally insane to me. Well, I mean, not really, right? Because Sam Harris in that very talk, I mean, he, he, he told you why he's not afraid of, of Joe Biden starting a, a civil war. Uh, the reason, or, or sorry, starting a nuclear war with Russia. Uh, the reason why uh, Sam Harris is fine with having a catatonic president, as he himself said, is because, as he himself said, all he wants is a president that can be bullied by the expert consensus as it is delivered to him through the apparatus of the State Department and the rest of the, the quasi-federal government that exists in a penumbra around the presidency. As long as someone can be bullied by that, whether they're stupid or catatonic, Sam Harris and the rest of the ruling class likes them. Because all they do is validate the opinions of the ruling class itself. They don't govern well. They don't govern effectively. It's an attempt to procure, as Carlyle said, government by steam. But, but that is what the preconception is. That as long as the steam engine of the bureaucracy keeps on chugging along, we are in good hands. It's not about the person whose finger is ultimately on the trigger the captain whose firm hands on the wheel, all it is about, is about submitting to, to, to the governance uh, of our priest class. So, I mean, I think, you know, ironically, that's what Sam clarified. He said, I mean, he said the quiet part loud, as they say. Novum for $20. Um, it says three, but it was 20. I'm reminded, this book always comes up. I'm reminded of the book Blood Meridian. It's one of my favorite books, so I, mean, I guess it, it's not strange that my my the people who watch this podcast also like this. Although, I mean, unlike one of my other favorite Southern Gothic books, uh, Wise Blood, I've only read it once. And a long time ago, I barely remember it. I'm reminded of the bu book Blood Meridian when the antagonist steps into a preacher's sermon and accuses him of fraud making congress with a goat everyone immediately believes that without question and chaos and hilarity ensued we are we are guilty of mob mentality by endlessly ponder how politics can become less tabloid yeah so i mean what cormac mccarthy really loves and what he really captures is uh the figure of like the chaos like the, the warrior of chaos and it, usually he has like a, a, a more minor and a more major character. So in No Country for Old Men, who I, I haven't actually read that book, but I've watched the movie a million times. And it, it's very faithful, I'm told. You have sort of Llewellyn Moss, which is sort of the minor chaotic character. The guy living on, basically he's living in, uh, I mean, he's, it's the 70s, I believe, but he's living in what will become the ruin of the American working class. He's a Vietnam vet. He lives in a trailer park, even though he, he, he has what should be a pretty good job. And, and he's very capable himself. 
And um, this is uh, uh, he sort of he's sort of a minor figure of chaos, and then the major figure of chaos obviously is Anton Chigurh. And the same thing is true for um, the in, in the book I believe it was the kid and the judge. The kid is like this character who's just this runaway. Who, who, who goes south and finds his way in this total war zone uh, between, I think it's the Apache Indians, Mexico, and, and, and what will later become Texas. And the people who wander into this place, uh, they just kind of want to see the world burn. They kind of, they, they want to feed uh, the absolute insanity of the situation because... There are creatures who thrive in the insanity of it all. I think Anton Chigurh copies this a lot. I mean, the Coen brothers' portrayal of him is absolutely perfect. Um, but you see this early in Blood Meridian, where where the guy just all he wants to do is is watch everything kind of burn. I mean, it's it's a very adolescent in a very adolescent way. And, and the same thing is true of. Um, you know, I think that the, this is sort of the egregore of online media, of sort of mob mentality. Um, it's, 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 as, as Novum said, right, it's the endless tabloid. Uh, all they want to be a part of is a lynch mob because it's fun, because you get to watch the old world burn and the old world is obviously corrupt. And at the same time, uh, I mean, it's, it, you, you feel powerful. You get to execute power even though the power will ultimately lead to more evil in the future. Politics becomes less tabloid uh, when when you encounter something that you don't want to burn down. And, you know, I, I, I indulge this. I indulge this in my own self. I, I indulge this in my own mind. There's this feeling that I, I just, all I want to do is watch the establishment burn down. And all, all I want to do is, is, is just is watch people deal with the consequences of their own shitty decision making. I, I want to see Ukraine implode and I want to see the oncoming energy and food crisis uh, go on around me. But you know, then you think about your family and you think about the people you love and you think about what's necessary to create a good future for them and you think about the books that you love and and the media that has given your life meaning that sounds weird i just said the texts that have given your life meaning and you you realize that the the devil will look after his own the, the devil will look after his own you're not here to be the vengeance of God. You're not here to be the devil's messenger. <laughs> You're here to to protect the true, the good, and the beautiful. And, and <clears throat> oh, I, I, I say that, and then I'm immediately going to say this. Like, I, I guess what the, the whole thing is that it's it's fake, right? So much of this this desire to protect, to be a protector and to be a preserver and, and to be someone that other people can rely on, that is the very instinct that they have exploited in us uh, to, to create the corruption that's now tearing the world apart through through the weight of its own mendacity. That That's absolutely the case. And so every time you participate in this, you feel like dirty, you feel fake. And, and in some sense, you are feeling fake, right? So, so here's here's um, here's an interesting insight. Um, I, I'm a big person who, since college, basically, I've loved the classics. When I got involved in sort of the classics reading group, it changed my life. And I mean, I, I'm, I shouldn't say like I haven't made an effort like the Franklin has to read through all of the classics, but of the classics that I have read, I, I found it incredibly enriching. And, um, and because of that, you know, and because I'm a history LARPer in my own mind, I guess you can't be a LARPer in your own mind, but whatever. I, I like to imagine what it would be like to go back in time. Who doesn't, right? 
And, and anyone who has those dual fascinations, what what is the thing you always dream about do, going back and fixing? You always dream about you always dream about going back and fixing the the quote unquote burning of the Library of Alexandria, right? Which is which is more symbolic. It was you know the Library of Alexandria who actually let it burn. Uh, the Christians blame the Muslims. The Muslims blame the Christians. And if we go by actual historical measure, it, it must have burned. The, the the latest it could have burned would be probably Julius Caesar. So it it probably it, you could you could imagine it might have been part of his Egypt expedition that accidentally burned it down, but probably it was even earlier than that, right? But really, it's all symbolic because what what we're really objecting to is that when you look back to the Western canon, you'll see obvious gaps. For instance, Sappho, who's a widely praised female poet, uh, also the origin of the term lesbian, uh, we only have like scraps of her poetry here and there, a few verses, a few stanzas. You can buy books written by Sappho, but it'll just be, it'll be fragments here and there. Maybe there'll be something approaching a full poem. And, And, you know, Greek poets were not known for being uh, quick, like Emily Dickinson. Uh, so, so you probably we probably don't have a very good understanding of what made Sappho a great poet. And what uh, also people might not understand is that the Iliad and the Odyssey are only two volumes of a multi-eight volume set that was supposed to completely chronicle in in epic poetry form the history of the um uh, of the war between uh the Achaeans and the Trojans or the Greeks and the Trojans as we've renamed them uh this is this is uh, the reason why Homer comes to us is that he he wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey all the other ones were written by other authors and only he was he was the greatest of all the poets, so those were the ones preserved. And that's sort of the story about how we lost all of these ancient texts, is that the reason why we, we, we lost them was because uh, people didn't like them very much, they weren't really worth it, and it took an enormous amount of effort to preserve a, a book or a, <clears throat> a, a tradition across the period that was uh, that was first, you know, uh, I should say, like late antiquity, and that was later the fall of the Roman Empire, and so people didn't love them, so people didn't copy them, so now they're missing. And um, you always want to like, oh, if I went back, I would want to, I would want to bring back all of those ancient volumes that were that were lost due to lack of interest during the Dark Ages. But I kind of almost, thinking about it again from where I stand right now, probably with us on the verge of a similar cultural dark age, I think to myself, I kind of want to learn how they survived the dark age. And, and moreover, I have a certain amount of contempt for, for, for the books weren't loved. There was something about them that wasn't good, Right. That that's the thing. Like I, I, I don't want to know how to. Per, I don't want to. What, what I'm really getting at here is I don't want to know how to preserve books that are unlovable just because they are here. I want to know how to find the books that should be preserved and to truly love them, because we know how books would have survived from 200 BC to present day. They survived by being loved and by being copied over. The only thing worrying is that ancient people weren't taught how to love goodness properly and they copied the wrong books over. But the the real thing is how do we how do we have the courage to sacrifice our own love, uh, our own lives, to preserve what is properly lovable. And then in addition to that, how do we have the prudence and the wisdom to see all the stuff from our own age and, and say, like, that thing, that piece of media, that piece of culture, 
that deserves to be truly loved. That deserves to survive to the next generation. That tradition is good enough for me to, to actually sacrifice my own ego to preserve him. This is what people complain about with the trad casts. Everyone in their first two years of conversion is like wearing the chapel veil, sometimes going to Latin mass. After the end of those two years, very few people are. And that indicates to me that they're not willing to sacrifice. Uh, they either, they're, either the, 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 the Latin mass is, they, they, either they have not properly trained themselves to truly love the Latin mass, or uh, they haven't, what they truly loved about the mass is embodied in the vernacular mass, in, in the ordinary mass, as it exists. Those are the two explanations. And I'm not saying which one is right. By all means, cultivate love of the Latin Mass for yourself and pursue it. But if you've truly cultivated love for the Latin Mass, you'll attend the Latin Mass after the first two years of your conversion. And for myself, I've cultivated love for the ordinary Mass. Um, so, so I, I guess, I, I guess what, what, what I want to say is, um, politics will become less of a tabloid when we actually do real politics and real politics is organized around training yourself to love the good and training yourself to be courageous enough to defend what you love. And if you're doing that, you're doing politics. And if you're not doing that, you're not doing politics. And, and, and in order to be truly good, it has to be truly real. European identity, as it exists currently, and you know, the reason why it's so tenuous, Academic Agent had this great talk where he talked to a white nationalist about the death of the Boomer Truth regime. And, and it was, it's great because this guy, I mean, he, he's obviously, I think he's associated with American Renaissance. Um, but he, he's a really, you can tell he's a really quality guy. You know, I might have some quibbles with him here or there ideologically, but you can tell he's a really stand-up guy. And, and he's honest about the failures of white nationalism. He says, like, I, I know for a fact you can't just organize a community around whiteness or around Europeanness. You, that, that everyone tries it and it never works. And it never works because this thing called whiteness, it's too abstract it's not real enough in your actual life. And it intersects with a reality of whiteness that is not lovable. The, the mainstay of the European ethnicity, the, the big populist block of that ethnicity, is dominated by a cultural milieu that has elected its own self-destruction. So the thing in the abstract, if it's worthy of being loved and sacrificed for, is not in a state where it's lovable. And it's not in a state where you can experience it as a real thing. So, so even even the white nationalist is telling you that, like, he he's a white nationalist as a hypothetical end state. I, and I'm not talking about like anti. I'm not talking about oh, I love my community of people, and that community is European, and they're being attacked for being white, and so we have to defend them. That's real. That, that is real. I, I hate the word white well-being, but if people prefer using my anti-anti-whiteness, which I think means the same thing, you know, I see he is the eunuch in here, and that's, and, and that's, um, you know, I, I think she likes the white well-being term more, but we're, it's, we're, we're quibbling over terminology. Defending your community because it's being attacked for being white is real. Like coalescing around a spiritual organizing principle that is whiteness is not, and 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 that's 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 the stumbling block. And I'm I'm glad to see that other even white nationalists see this at this stage. That that's that's a stumbling block for so many things. You have to find out what's truly good. Then you have to make it real. Then you have to train yourself to love it enough to defend it and to sacrifice for it. And that's how you do real politics. 
All right, cool. That was a very generous chat, so it was very, very long. Um, I'm going to go on to Izzy Eunuch. Uh, she just left. But I will answer her super chat with the hope that she listens to the VOD. Um, Yiz the eunuch for $3 USA. Tonight you said some of the wisest, most enlightened stuff about the human condition and modernity I've ever heard. I'm thankful we're friends and I'm able to learn from you. The future is ours. Uh, yes, I, Yiz, you and Philos, I owe a live stream to. I'm so backlogged. Every year I do a live stream with Fritz Imperial and the Franklin. And I'm overdue for both of those live streams. I know I've tried to organize them. I, I did. I, I. I'm also overdue with. I'm overdue for a stream with Sargon of the Cod. And I'm. I've got like four, like 14 messages about live streams in my inbox. Um, I'll, I'll try to get all of these done. Uh, but yeah, it's it is what it is. Thank you so much, Yiz, and uh, I hope to talk to you in the future. Uh, forgive me for moving on quickly because I have to get to other questions that I might be more verbose about. Uh, Danny Ellie for $3. Hi, distributists. Wondering what you might think about Dugan's daughter's death and who killed her and how the mainstream media is t talking about it. Well, I have no idea how the mainstream media is talking about this. I Assassinations are highly questionable. They're highly questionable in the context of war, to the extent of which, you know, when I was talking about treachery and assassination uh, with my friend Morgoth, we were talking about von Stauffenberg. Um, and I think I, I don't want to speak for Morgoth, but I'll speak for myself. When I would, so Hitler, for those of you who don't know, Hitler, there was a very credible assassination attempt uh, targeted at Hitler in 1944, brought on actually by the right wing of the Reich. He, it was a right wing attempt to assassinate Hitler, which, so this is, as you might imagine, <laughs> an assassination attempt for a right winger who doesn't like Hitler, <laughs> like myself. Um, an assassination attempt that I'm very, very sympathetic with. I'm very sympathetic with the perpetrators and very sympathetic, I'm very antithetic to the target, <laughs> but it still is really dirty. It's still the, the nature of the assassination itself with the bomb and the suitcase. Uh, it's a little, and I don't want to judge von Stauffenberg. You know, I, I, I think I can't imagine the situation, the decision he needed to, to do that, to try to take out Hitler at that moment in Germany. But assassinations are always really thorny. Then add on top of it, assassinating a non-political figure and a, a woman who, who very, I mean, I, I've been told that she said nasty things about Ukrainians, but really who hasn't said nasty things about either Russians or Ukrainians in the last eight months? I've tried not to do that, but who hasn't? I, we would be assassinating all, all of the women in my extended family <laughs> if, we, if we went after people who said nasty things about one or of the two belligerents in in the in in the in the Russia uh, Ukraine war. This is not a legitimate target of assassination, as far as I'm concerned, and so the politics almost don't matter. I'm obviously not a Duganist. I, I think Dugan. You know, I appreciate that he operates as a thinker in the distant sphere and that his enemies are my enemies. I've been informed by people who have read him that he said any number of really cringy stuff. But again, who isn't cringe in this day and age, in this confused era of ideology? Who isn't? Who among us hasn't been cringe? I, I, I mean, it... I don't know. Whenever I see the victim of assassination, as was Daria Dugan, I, I imagine being Mark Anthony holding the body of Caesar. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know who assassinated her. I guess they thought she was ambitious. <laughs> I, I don't know. There, I, to my mind, just the, the sort of Bayesian priors are so much against this and so across so many different dimensions that I can't help but but see this as a crime 
And my heart can't help but go out to Dugan, who saw his daughter assassinated in front of his eyes via a car bomb. Um, and I, I, I'm really disgusted by people who use this as, uh, as like a meme, as a way to get back at their political opponents. Oh, you're just hurting yourself, guys, like when you do this. Assassinations are real human moments. If someone was assassinated, you better hate that side so much. I mean, to approve of the assassination, you better hate that side enough to go to war to it yourself. And, it, and, and to sort of meme it, it, it's taking something that's so real and visceral and human and turning it into something that's so cheap and disposable and, and temporal and, and dirty. Uh, why would you do that, I guess, is what I would say. Why would you do that to yourself? So, I guess, you know, fuck the people who are trying to dunk on Dugan because of this. Uh, it's, this is not the time. And in all probability, Daria Dugan was taken out by our enemies in the actual establishment. They, they probably weren't Westerners, but they, there's a high probability that are a few of our indiscriminate dollars <laughs> that went into the, pro the pockets of questionable Ukrainian-affiliated groups might have found its way into the improvised explosive devices that killed her. And that's disgusting. I don't know. To, for me, it's not seemly to speculate on this, and it's certainly not seemly for me to, to rehash my complaints about Duganism at this time. So um, thank you very much. Um, but I'll go on here. Um, <laughs> people, people always have like the same super chats. I mean, I, I, I love talking about this stuff. So really, it's um, no skin off my. And I always talk about it in a different way. But the Shrek video, guys. I mean, I'm going to try to find time to record the second half. I don't even own the same microphone I record the first half on. I could release the first half, but then all I would hear about is, when's part two coming out? When's part two coming out? And that would be even worse. Um, uh, so, so I don't know. Whenever my voice is good enough and it feels like an urgent thing to do at the time. Okay, so T, uh, TN1000 for $3 USA. We talked about steampunk a while back, and I remember a piece of steampunk that is unironically Victorian and awesome. And funny enough, it's an anime. Have you ever seen Steam Boy? Well, yeah, isn't Steam Boy, um, isn't that one of, isn't that a manga that was made by, like, the father of manga? The guy who did Blackjack and uh, Speed Racer and all that stuff? Uh, I thought, like, that was, his, like, his, like, last manga or whatever, and it was turned into a, it was turned into a anime right around the time that when I stopped watching anime. Um, I guess I could give it a shot. Uh, I, I, I saw a trailer for it right after I finished watching The Last Exile. And The Last Exile was really, you know, as far as steampunk goes, again, it, it's sort of when I became very discreetly aware of the growing distance between uh, the form of the anime and, and the form of the anime fans. In California, at least, the early 2000s was when the LGBT stuff, LGBTQ plus stuff, really started to come and intersect with the anime community heavily. Everyone else saw this happen probably more around 2010, but, but in the cowl scene, that happened about five to six years earlier. And, and the distance between the world that they were idolizing in these uber-Victorian poses and, and how they presented themselves, especially as I started reading primary sources that came from that world, uh, the distance was just unignorable and, and really kind of grating. And because of that, my appetite for steampunk anime was probably bottom of the barrel. The problem right now is my wife doesn't like anime very much. And I mean, I've shown her Vampire Hunter D and Akira and Ghost in the Shell. And her reaction to all of those, which were sort of the three movies that in my own mind were standing out as being movies that might be appealing. 
her reaction to all of those things was meh. So, I mean, trying to start a new anime is really hard. Uh, someone recommended to me Death Note, and I really didn't like it. Uh, I didn't like how the character acted. It, it was impossible for me to imagine that character in my world. And I understand that maybe like some valedictorian, I mean, he was way too over emotional and, 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 and he, he kind of flailed about in this really effeminate way that it seemed to be, maybe it's a Japanese thing, but it's um something about Death Note really rubbed me the wrong way. So anyway, um, thank you very much for the super chat. I'm going to go on here. Um, hey, Dave, thanks for the great content. So, Efrani for $20 USA. Uh, thank you very much. Hey, Dave, thanks for the great content. Maybe some uh, Palestrina or uh, Machout Mass for intro, outro music. Um, uh, Palestrina. Where? Palestrina. Um, oh, 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 yes. Okay, yeah, the, the composer. Okay, yeah, um, maybe. I mean, classical music... Well, okay, for right now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep the folk music, but maybe we'll switch to classical music. Classical music always has... The, I, I really don't like things that seem too pretentious. The, what I really liked about folk music when I was into it, and... This is something that I want to talk about more. I was really into the whole new, new, new bluegrass revival that was really kicked off by Oprah the Aurora Thou. And what I liked about folk music is it seemed so open. It seemed that the people who did it had to actually embrace the discipline that came along with the tradition. And so even if they were horrible blue staters, even if they were in their politics complete progressives, they had to taste the world and partake of it to a degree that in anime you really didn't. And it didn't hurt also that people tended to be a lot less degenerate <laughs> lifestyle-wise, even though they were kind of snobby uh, progressives for the most part. But at any rate, the, what I liked about folk music was the sense that it was open. It was a sense, it was a sense that you could just you could just be and listen to it. Whereas uh, with classical music, there's this layer that to listen to it, you have, you're, you're, what makes classical music difficult is that it's, even if it's not a virtue signal, it communicates that I'm intelligent, I'm smart, I listen to classical music. So if I were to pick a piece of classical music, I would really want to make sure that it was, it was like obscure enough and non-pretentious enough. Like, it couldn't be Elgar. It couldn't be... It couldn't be Rachmaninoff. And it couldn't be, like, Mozart. It would have to be something that would be... I don't know. It would have to be something like... Maybe some minimalism or something like that, right? I don't know. And that might be... That might make a good good music for... Uh, for uh, it couldn't be Philip Glass, either, because that's sort of a hipster thing as well. I, I hate music as a method of signaling things. All throughout the 90s, I mean, I guess the 90s had good music and people were talking about uh, your musical taste as, as a signal of your identity. I remember that the movie Lady Bird, which was about growing up in California in the 90s, very, very close to where I grew up. Um, she, she gets to college and the, the guy who's like trying to be her friend critiques her CD collection as, as not being like, intellectual enough that's that was a staple of like um 2000 era uh virtue signaling was through music but ever since i got through that era I, i've been allergic to music as a mechanism to signal that you're intelligent or that you're cool and what i love about folk music is that's not a component of it it's 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 the farthest away as you can i mean for a while it was cool when oh brother were arthur came out but after it became non-cool, that's actually the, the best era of it. <laughs> uh, when it's neither cool nor uncool, it just is. Um, Zachary Nelson for $10 USA. 
I'm convinced that one of the right's big issues is the lack of a positive vision. You can use clear them out to an extent, but that doesn't build anything. And to me, it seems that an, it seems anathema to the message of the right. I'm also not sure that religion will be persuasive compared to leftist hedonism. Well, I mean, it's not, but do you care? Because you're not trying to go... I mean, it's not going to be persuasive to the masses, but it's going to be persuasive to people who are looking... It might be persuasive for people who are looking for a higher calling. In that really great stream that Alex Kashuda and Aaron McIntyre did, Aaron McIntyre did about the same thing I just finished talking about, um, Alex Kashuda really highlighted the problem. And she's very insightful. She's mainly known for interviews, but she's very insightful herself. And... Um, and for that reason, uh, I, I'm always reminded of that when I, I watch her on other people's podcasts because she's for once not in the position of an interviewee. But she said uh, the real challenge is that it has to be religious because religion is the only thing that transmits itself intergenerationally. But the second thing is, is you really have to believe it. You really have to believe it. And Aaron followed up with the fact that the problem with the what Molebug and and to a lesser extent Bronze Age pervert are trying to do is they're trying to the, the, their vitalism. I don't remember reading this in in Gray Mirror uh, Garvin's blog, but 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 this is definitely what they're trying to do. They're trying to use this concept of vitalism, by by which it means you know uh, uh, kind of what I'm alluding to here. It's um. It's the the idea that uh, a, a telos that makes you more engaged in reality, that that makes you a more healthy human spiritually, in in whatever vague way we understand that, that is, uh, what what the, what the minimum, uh, viable level of religion is, and. Aaron, very wisely said, in some sense they're true. I'm actually adding this a little bit, but the nature of any real religion is that it's not minimum, it's particular, and it's hard. And and, and it's and it's grounded in something. Minimum viable religion doesn't really do it. Uh, vitalism doesn't do it. Vitalism, I mean, I, I'm going to pause here and praise it, I said that Bronze Age pervert is the, he is the answer to the question of what comes next. What comes next is a reset to more fundamental modes of living and then deciding what technology makes it through that eye of the needle. We have to go through the eye of the needle and more in the sort of eye of the needle, the camel has to go through and it can only take the technology that's essential and that, that's vital Bronze Age pervert is correct about that, but like he's he's viewing this. The reason what's false about Bronze Age pervert is that vitalism is the correct description of the process. Looking down, as if you were looking at this process like an ant colony, but what's what's very the, the thing, or, or as if you were looking at from evolution. The thing about ant colonies is that they don't actually work in reality, the way that they look like they work from the outside. And religions aren't experienced the way you can describe them as being vitalistic or anti-vitalistic. Uh, religions work because of particular relationships we have with particular experience, spiritual experiences, with particular spiritual habits, with particular holy places. G.K. Chesterton very wisely said, he said that religious law was not developed by saying, you don't hit me, and then I won't hit you. It was developed by saying, we will never hit ourselves inside the holy place. Can you practice religion without holy habits, without prayer habits, or without, uh, without a sacred place, without a sacred tabernacle? I don't think you can. Can, can you practice religion without having family relations with other religious people. Now, that sounded weird, but being in, in, in a, a deep friendship or with a, a deep bond with other people who share in that religious tradition, that's very difficult. I don't think that's possible. 
But once you talk about that in the particular, in the specific, and how it actually exists in our lives, I, it, 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 it is, it, it, as, as you were saying, it's not negative, uh, but it also can't be general. <clears throat> that being said, so, so everything you're saying is, is true. Uh, the, 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 the actual living growth will be religious, it will be particular, and it will be embodied. And that's why I think of all the projects we have, basket weaving is probably the most important and the one that I want to try to do more of. Um, the, the, I'm going to, I'm, 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 I'm coming up with the count, the counterpoint, the other shoot's going to drop here, but funnily enough, when I mentioned basket weaving, basket weaving is not going to give you a tightly knit community. When we have the Sildings Conference, and there's an equivalent Sildings Conference, I think it's called the Witton Conference in England right now in the United Kingdom. Uh, these are general places. These are broad coalitions. I know Yarvin has a community of people in New York and in London that do poetry readings and that have like a party scene, which just seems really weird to me. And I'm pretty close to that. I think I might have gotten an invite that I turned down because I am. Uh, like my kid was sick because we're always sick around here. This this year, this is the year of the sickness. We can't maintain our health. Um, but but anyway, um, this is important. The, the the via negativa is very very important. Progressivism is rotting from the head down. The people who peel off from progressive rot are going to know each other and they're going to need a place to communicate intellectually and communicate spiritually before they can find their homes. They're lost and they need to be directed. The intellectual space, the political space, is geared via negativa and always will need to be geared via negativa because it is fundamentally a place of seeking and guidance. We guide the lost, we don't guide the found. And we fight our enemies, we don't fight our friends. And so political spaces and intellectual spaces are always going to be organized via negativa. In those spaces, the goal will be to guide people towards the seed beds where they can set up roots. But when you do intellect, when you do tasks of intellect or, or you engage in dialectic, you are doing something that is fundamentally uprooted. And when you engage in war, you are participating in something that's fundamentally chaotic. And of course, as we know, politics are an extension only of war. Or politics are an extension of war through different means. These will always be done along the via negativa distinction. They'll always be dominated by friend-enemy distinction. And because of that, the sort of purely negative community of clear them out, uh, the, 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 the sensation that we need to resist the dying of our own civilization, and it's probably already dead, that will always be the first step in the organizing principle of us politically. But the point of the right-wing movement is simply to give birth to a Promethean movement. And that Promethean movement will be specific and it will be grounded. The Promethean movement has to emerge from the earth, from the lowest to the highest, but it must be planted by people who are standing aloof and unrooted above it. That's, that's the best I can do via analogy. But I will say, as aloof as all of the New York p poetry readings are, uh, I noticed that there was an article in the New York Times. You always know that I'm going to say something insightful when it starts from, oh, guys, there was an article in the New York Times. But there was, because my New York Times reading relatives forwarded it to me. It was written by Julia Yost of First Things, who was an excellent podcaster back when she did podcasters, although she did sound a little bit like the female Ben Stein. And this was about the emergent Catholic community in New York, which is as you might expect, dominated by hipsters that are kind of, and she's honest about that, some of them are very much LARPing as traditionalists, and some of them are. 
This, I think you can see, is intimately connected to the New York scene of people who are doing, um, who, who are doing sort of distant politics and poetry readings with Curtis Jarvin and, and everyone there and, and, and the anti-woke culture here. But, but all of this is, is, is room, springer, room Springer, the devil's playground, in reverse. Sure, some of the people are hipsters. Some of them are just there for the spectacle and they'll move on. But some people are going to find a deeper spirituality. And, and they will become part of the seedbed that will lead to something greater and that will bring forward a new generation of people. And, and a generation of people who are more able to be the shepherds of, of, of the people in the hinterlands who have had their communities fish rot all the way through their brain through the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and are looking for shepherds, and are looking for people who are able to bring them into something deeper. So that's that's the best the best I can give for you, Zachary Nelson. I hope that that helps. <clears throat> Dreadnought for fifteen dollars USA. The new Tradcast. I understand this impulse. I think a lot like. I think a lot, like me, came back to God after seeing the incredible degeneracy around us. And sometimes in us, well, very much inside of us, there is the enemy within at all times. We come into the church and then we say, Father James Marchand is playing footsie with the same thing we fled. This tends to go down badly. Yeah, I know, because what you're doing is your... Oh, this is always the problem, isn't it? This is always the problem, and you know, back in the day when Fritz Imperial was, uh, um, he was sort of a regular on my show, and we we kind of shared discords, and, and we did a lot of stuff. But but he was very concerned about Father James Martin and Audrey Assad, and these people who were sort of on the the verge of apostasy, and. Um, And I felt very difficult about this, right? Because what you're doing is you're coming into a church and the first thing you're going to do as a convert is like kneecap the people who have been there for 30 or 40 years and have dedicated their life to it. That's not a correct move to make. And, and furthermore, this is not symmetrical. You cannot create a strong church by politicizing the church in a right-wing direction. That is not possible. What needs to happen is you need to be what needs to happen is you need to be a devout Catholic. You need to foster your own religious community. You need to you need to enforce orthodoxy in your religious community and always defend orthodoxy, always defend doctrine, always defend doctrine. Trad or not, trad or Nova Sordo like myself, always defend doctrine and always defend it loudly inside the context of the church. But when it comes to anything else political, keep your night bites out of the church. They always strike first. They always strike first. You always move the politics out of the church. If they want to, if they want to bring their 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 vindictiveness, and they want to give that a Catholic veneer, that's their business. But once you politicize the church, you are introducing chaos into what should be your seedbed. The two spheres have to remain separate. The night political night fights cannot exist inside the church in any sense of the word. So, so you know, make fun of James Martin's political views on Twitter all the live long day. The second you are speaking inside the church as a Catholic, he is a priest who is just misguided, but is a faithful servant to the church until the day he apostatizes, is to the day he apostatizes, and not until then. The context is essential because of the dual nature of our mission is both to resist progressive degeneration, which is necessarily political and necessarily negative, and to try to create something that could exist into the future, which is necessarily Promethean and is necessarily anti-political. It's too basic to be political. I hope that helps. 
glow in the dark for three dollars USA. I think I might call time on this. Oh my God, it's eleven thirty. Uh, glow in the dark for three dollars USA. Sam Harris and his kind show they worship state institutions and their priests. Can we snap them out of it, or do we have to go full Roman and Hadrian on them and their temples? Go full Roman Hadrian. Hadrian was one of the Flavian emperors, but I don't recognize him as a, a great iconoclast. I don't recognize. Was he like Diocletian? A Diocletian is the 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 post. You know, uh, the the late emperor who's most known for his anti-Christian iconoclasm. Um, I don't know. I mean, at this point, what's so great about the Sam Harris thing is this is the... I mean, you know, politics is all about ultimate points and decisions. And this is, this is your... This is your decision point right now. Sam Harris has now definitively said that truth and his politics are at a crossroad, what side are you on? Because you're not going to get anything but institutional mendacity if you follow Sam Harris. And you know what? I This is a prediction, and I don't know if it's true, but I'm be- I would bet a non-insignificant amount of money at this point that Sam Harris is going to go woke. It's the only option for him right now. He'll be welcomed back. The cathedral wants its smart white men back on side. They've been they've been, they've been bleeding them since Gamergate in droves. They want them back on side. He won't bring them back on side, but the possibility that he will will be enough for them to woo him. And God knows he's not going to have anyone else wooing him in the future, not after this. And so when Sam Harris goes woke, The path before us, the division in the sand, will be even more clear. And and more importantly, the linkage between liberalism and eventual wokeness will be made ever clearer. And that's the only thing we can do to snap them out of it. Follow Sam Harris, you follow his experts, and emphasize you follow his experts, because the problem is the experts, the problem is the institutional law. You follow him, you become woke eventually. Or you can go in a different direction. You can follow truth as Sam Harris by his own admission has parted from. And you can and you can and you can follow you can see how far the rabbit hole goes. <laughs> Not to get all Morpheus on you, but you know as the as the great Curtis has said, uh, say what you will about the Wachowskis. The Matrix is genius, and that scene is genius. Rasmus Jensen for $15 USA. Everyone I know who's my age, early 20s, implicitly wants to die. Antinatalism is common, although wouldn't, I wouldn't recognize the word, and misanthropy more so. I admit I have many of these trappings myself. Any advice? Okay. <laughs> Let's tell you a story. Um, I... So, um, I'm trying to help out with this. Obviously, I spend time at work, away from my family. And uh, this, this last week, um, I, I was planning on having a little bit of time away from my kid. But because I was quarantined, I spent like seven or eight days away from him. Not in like, I was, you know, I was pretending to have like a hiking day away from him. Uh, Unfortunately, I was having a day staring at the ceiling of a hotel room away from him, uh, which is the worst of both uh, situations. Um, But I noticed that my own implicit misanthropy, my own desire to see it all burn down, increased exponentially. When I was away from somebody who I, you know, obviously my wife inspires in me the same emotions, right? The same desire to see things continue and and get better. But but she's also the same age as me, right? Uh, She's also the same age as me. There's no, no, like, even even my love for my wife, you can still indulge in, like, after us, uh, what is it, après moi, la deluge, right? After me, the flood, the end of the world should come. Um, that's 
that is a natural response to seeing everything around you being corrupted. But when, when you actually come and develop a relationship with people who are younger and, and see their own reaction to, to experiencing the world for the first time, you'll discover your own enthusiasm again. Walking around and, and looking at the natural world through the eyes of a child is a huge way to defeat apathy. I, I'm plugging from social media will also do the same thing because you'll, you'll start noticing little things that you're, you're not noticing when you're, you're, you know, you're on your phone. Like, you know, for instance, um, before I did this live stream, I was walking around the apartment complex with my son and like we were like catching grasshoppers and trying to catch unsuccessfully frogs that were eating the grasshoppers and, and like it's a it's a pretty depressing looking modernist complex but the fact that that little like very like life-giving moment can exist in, in, in a very squirreled way in a complex that's made out of concrete and immigrants uh, very intelligent immigrants who don't speak know or like each other Life's going to go on and it's going to be beautiful. And even the smallest piece of goodness could justify an entire world comprised of shit and piss and degenerate, you know, hateful white progressives that, that, that want to turn the entire universe into a mirror reflecting back their own narcissism onto themselves. The smallest moment of reaching out to something outside of yourself would make the entire universe of evil worth it. That's my only answer to this. And what you need to collect, what I was hoping to collect during the vacation, <laughs> but couldn't, are little moments that will remind you of this. Uh, <laughs> and by contrast, I accumulated the exact opposite, right? Um, uh, you've got to go for the particular. Um, read, read a book that will also help. Read, read, read a book all the way through that you really, really, really like. Uh, don't challenge yourself too much. That's really important. Like, don't be, don't get halfway through Moby Dick. Uh, don't start reading um, the Decameron and then decide you don't like it. Uh, read something that's like at your level, but is a little bit challenging, right? Catcher in the Rye might be a good one. I, I don't know. It's not. I don't think it's great literature, but it's it's certainly challenging to put yourself in that world, that that dead world. Um. And um, yeah, even little things like that. Um, the the reason why you want to die is because everything is fake about your life or feels fake. Or not every, everything isn't fake about your life. The majority of the stuff you encounter is fake. And we implicitly, as humans, want to destroy that which is fake and that which is lying to us. And because that is so obviously the majority of what's in your life, you want to tear it down. What you have to understand is that it's your life is real, right? Your life is real, and the life that your life could bring forward is real, and your love for the universe is real. <laughs> and so even if everything you experience in, or the majority of you experience in your life is real, if you were to sacrifice your life to destroy the fake, all you would be doing is taking more real things out of the universe and you're not even destroying anything that won't destroy itself. So um, that, that's, 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 the, that's the only thing that I can say for, for, for Miss It. I can tell you I really feel you, though. I, I, I'm, I, you, everyone can see Clown World is, sounds 2019. Piss Earth sounds a lot more 2022. And maybe dying Earth will sound a lot more 2023 when our food crisis kicks in. Everyone can feel the fakeness around them. Everyone wants to push it over. But 
sacrificing the real to destroy the fake is no way to live. It's not living. It's just turning yourself into a demon. And and that feels like, it feels viscerally like you're doing something. Because, I mean, destroying evil is always, uh, it's always like a life-giving exercise. Uh, but 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 when you're destroying evil and you're not fighting for good, you're just an agent of chaos. Um, a while back, so Creeper Weirdo for fifteen dollars. A while back, the New York Times did a poorly titled article um, on recent writings that concentrate on cannibalism as an element. Why do you think this is? Also, how do people keep on falling for these establishment boobs? Um, well, uh, so cannibalism, uh, so I, I don't think that this is part of a concerted effort. I mean, I think the bug eating stuff probably is part of a concerted effort to get us to eat bugs as part of a consumer product because this is part of their whole beyond meat push. But, but I think the cannibalism thing, I don't think cannibalism, unless we're in really dire circumstances, I don't think cannibalism will ever be cost efficient in modernity. So I, I, what I really think that what they're trying to do is they're trying to elicit a reaction. Um, so this is the, the um, um, there, there was this podcast oh, uh, last week with these, uh, like these complete parodies of progressive women, these total shrikes screaming about how uh, they, 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 they loved aborting their own kids and how they wanted to make abortion into pornography uh, to make it a consumer product because that's how they can make it acceptable under capitalism. Uh, and it's just absolutely disgusting. They look disgusting, they sound disgusting. But then you realize um, this is all fake. Like they're, they're trying to be objectionable because the only way they can feel alive is getting into a big political fight with uh, with pro-lifers. Uh, why would I give them that? Why would I give them the vitality of feeling like they actually hit a nerve? And I just let them shriek into the camera. Uh, and I mean, anyone who sees that that's worthwhile is going to understand that to the extent that that's real, it's disgusting. Uh, and anyone... I, I don't think that they're honestly trying to convince us cannibalism isn't disgusting. They're they're just trying to elicit a reaction because that that's the only way they can feel vital. The only there I mean it's, it's the fate of all servants of chaos. The only way you can feel alive is by destroying other people, by keeping the fire going, and they're they're in the process of burning out right now. Okay, a Russian name for three dollars euro. Uh, so, guys, please stop the super chats. I need to close this out in twenty minutes, <laughs> and I still need to read the poem. So, um, I still have some water here. Uh, cheers. I tried to do tea, but um, I was like thinking I was like thinking of a beverage for the show. But uh, I find tea oftentimes dehydrates me uh, more than water does. Uh, so Russian name says Vosh style old left socialism and communism is where the regime dunks young white midwits to LARP as distance until it feels comfortable to get them there, uh, to get rid of them. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just, I just agree with this. I, I wouldn't even give them credit of being old style communists. The only one who's the only person I have seen online that is an honest to God old style communist is Caleb Maupin and and, and some formies from Zero Books, and for me and, and Zero Books really from what I have seen has gone down the Vosh route. Uh, when when you see real old school communists like CCP people, the 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 kind of feeling they give you is very distinct. It, it, it doesn't look anything like Ben Burgess or or these sort of fake people that appear like Hassan Piker. 
uh, it's not social media generated. Like these people believe in, in physical materialism and it shows. Uh, so I wouldn't give them credit for being old style of anything. But yeah, yeah, I'm um, communism and like it used to be new atheism. Now it's obviously communism. They have to tell young white men, oh my God, there's a place for you in the coalition. Just believe this. And like, you know, you'll be on our side and we don't cancel people on our side. We only cancel the guys that aren't on our side anymore who we kicked off our team for not repeating our, our latest pack of lines. Um, yeah, so I, I totally agree with you. Thanks for the super chat. Um, eventually, the, they'll have to cancel the Vosh people, but not today because they need them too much. The unfortunate thing is that the human quality of, of these young men is going down. They understand at this point that they're, they're getting the, the low cards in the deck. They're, they're not picking up quality young men interested in politics. They're picking up men who want to do politics as a slacktivist lifestyle. And there's a deep understanding that that's not going to be good enough. Uh, not for the immediate future, certainly. A glow in the dark for USA $3. My opinion from observing what is going on in the bureaucracy breeds... Um, my opinion from observing what's going on Bureaucracy breeds mediocrity and corruption, whether it is in the private or public sectors. Yes, I would agree with that. I think, though, that, you know, when it comes to most of these things, the private-public distinction is really... I think you alluded to this in your super, super chat. The private-public distinction is really quite minor. Uh, once media corporations get to a certain size... They begin cooperating with the government to an extent that makes their separation from the federal government really quite meaningless. And the same thing is true for a lot of other industries through the process of regulation. And uh, it's harder to know what you mean by bureaucracy. Uh, bureaucracy is a, a fact of, of all complex societies. What I would say is this. The complexity of all managerial classes grows. Typically, when the complexity of managerial classes grows to where it's no longer effective at doing its job, we begin to call them bureaucracies, by which we simply mean ineffective, uncontrolled, little tidbit, little pieces of power that are pushed into an oligarchic formation. That naturally breeds mediocrity and corruption because of the fact that if it didn't, if they weren't corrupt, they would abolish themselves because there's no need for their jobs to exist. And, and, and because of that, they have to develop this egregore, as Alex Kashida uh, describes it, this hive mind. Where, where they preserve the narrative that justifies the existence of their own funding. And, and that's true for corporations that have monopolies, and that's true for government. And, and it, it's really more of a question of complexity and, and effectiveness. The complexity goes up and the effectiveness goes down. Um, Nerve and Maker, I keep getting recommended books by Ursula K. Le Guin, based on my reading of Jean Wolf, but she shout she see she but she sounds like a shit lip. She sounds like a shit lib down by the seashore where she shills for socialism. Um no, uh sorry, uh, tongue tongue twister, tongue twister. I never could do the S H properly. Have you read any of her books? Um I've read the wit the first book of the Wizard of Earthsea when I was like 10 and it was good. And then I started in, I can't remember whether I read The Left Hand of Darkness or not. I think I did actually. Yeah, it was The Left Hand of Darkness, right? That's that's the one with the gender swip swapping ones. Um, Ur Ursula K. Le Guin is absolutely a shit lib. And she absolutely is sort of a, a prime cathedral uh, adherent. And I'm sure her politics are terrible. 
Um, but it's kind of like I'll say I'll say this. I mean, like Gravity's Rainbow, or the Illuminatus trilogy, or uh, I don't know, uh, On the Road, the the famous Beatnik Ginsburg Ginsburg's on. No, it's um, not Ginsburg. I forget. There's another beat, beat author, um, or, or Catcher in the Rye. Uh, all all of these books are are part of a mode of thought that, in very very short order, in one generation, immediately led to wokeism. Everyone who was on that highway ended at wokeism. Uh, but I still highly recommend reading these books. Uh, oh, what? Someone tell me who wrote On the Road. Um, I'm gonna look this up. I'm sorry. I'm not on the road. On the road. Kerouac, of course. Jack Kerouac. Okay. All of these books are valuable to us as period pieces. Uh, they're almost. They can. You're, first of all, if you're a relatively considerate person, and they're not gonna like corrupt you, right? And they're not even gonna corrupt your kids if you gave them to them because the the narrative form is is at this point too far away from us it's like getting an old disease you already have the antibodies to them uh so so it's not going to be corrupting to you you have to read ursula k Le Guin as a period piece of 1970s feminism and she's a good writer, and she's a perfect example of that. Just as you have to read J.D. Salinger and Jack Kerouac as sort of a period piece of, of the Beat Generation. And, um, and you, you can even learn things from it, because, because, because Ursula K. Le Guin is writing in the 70s and 80s, uh, her feminism is very experiential. So it's intimately related to her experiencing the world and just reporting on the world as she sees it. Modern feminism is not like that. Modern feminism is is just people viewing things from an ideological lens. But but I can't emphasize enough how much J.D. Salinger and Jack Kerouac are, are just reporting what they're feeling from the zeitgeist, and that includes a lot of like primary experiences. And because of that, the human nature of the time itself shines through, and you can learn stuff from that. Um, even as you recognize this ideology, uh, Ursula K. Le Guin, I think, is a very valuable author because she's period, because she describes a certain feeling as she was genuinely experiencing it. I think her later stuff can probably be, be dismissed as ideological because it very much, it very much kind of... I became captured by by power and by politics, um, but I wouldn't say she's like as stunning as Jean Wolfe, where there's like very little that's like that, with the possible exception of like Frank Herbert. Um, but but I enjoyed reading her because of what she represented in the past as as sort of an element of history, uh, less so as as like a living thinker. Um, so I don't know with that mindset I would probably I might take it on cringe walker um hey uh, I saw a picture of you with uh, the great master himself cringe walker three dollars USA I actually quit my PhD because the planned semester work was an art gallery inventing a climate change religion as a form of cultural force for good I was shocked by the complete ashes of civilization that is academia. Yeah, I, 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 thought, I mean, I don't want to dox you, but I'm pretty sure in engin engineering. But I mean, okay, I mean, you know, I got a PhD. Um, it, it really doesn't make it, it doesn't mean anything. You probably got out with a master's degree. That will do as much as as much for you as a PhD would. Uh, I applied for academic jobs after my PhD. I got none of them. Uh, they all had me write diversity political allegiance statements, and I was the most insincere writer of those imaginable, and they all have political priorities right now. Academia is absolutely dead. In an industry, a PhD and a master's degree is not going to make any difference in a field that's as technical as engineering. They only want to know what you know and what you can do. Publications are nice. They like publications, so always be building. Just take what you were doing in your PhD, 
put it in the paper, submit, submit, submit. Get some publications under your belt, and then find something that pays the bills, right? A PhD is just a list of publications. That's all it is. If you don't publish during your PhD, in my opinion, you've essentially done a master's degree that's cost you three or four more years of your life. A PhD, unfortunately, because I didn't, probably didn't publish as much as I should have, but it's just a list of publications. Now, some of the publications are corrupted to a certain extent. In engineering, they're mostly still, they're mostly still fine, right? But I'm sorry that that PhD um, uh, didn't pan out. I will say, when I was an undergraduate, before I switched to being more um, math oriented with my current degree, I, I was a mechanical engineer that did. Um, I was really interested in like alternative energy systems. And I did a number of research projects, like, you know, little ones when I was an undergraduate uh, for people who were working on energy projects who were actually weren't that many. I was kind of surprised. And then I figured out that like half of these things are all like the people who are working on these projects, the technology is never going to be mature. Uh, but they're selling it like it is. And this is kind of, it's not like a real scam, but it's obviously, because it's real science, right? It's, it's going to give you like a 0 0.01 improvement on the efficiency. And over a long enough time period, if someone's going to use this technology, it's going to generate a lot of benefit, right? But the overarching politics of the program was, at, was kind of fundamentally corrupt. These technologies like wind turbines and solar panels these are highly, highly, highly developed technologies. The amount of efficiency improvements we've seen in the last 20 years is actually, all things considered, pretty minimal. Now, of course, who knows what the future will bring, but I haven't seen anything revolutionary on the horizon. Not certainly the way that something like CRISPR is or gene editing or the way that like AI has some revolutionary technologies on the horizon. And so slowly, 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 what you're seeing is the field is being consumed by ideology. And what you're describing to me here, where it's just like, it was an art gallery inventing a climate change religion. Yeah, I mean, that sounds even more ideological. Uh, I mean, it's just tragic. I'm so sorry, Cringe Walker. I mean, for whatever it's worth, it, it's probably not going to cost you any money, <laughs> right? Uh, with with, with it, it, just focus on building Always be building, always be submitting. Just do that, and I think you can't go wrong. Novum for twenty dollars USA. Um, uh, but but yeah, um, it's it's really sad to see the state of academia. I'll say that. Novum for twenty dollars USA. Um, I'm almost done. Hey guys. In truth, I don't understand why pot is still associated with progressives. Well, I know that. Despite all propaganda I was subjected to in college, the biggest stoners I knew are rural conservatives, and I could care less. Federal legal pot couldn't be a more obvious empty promise, and blue states aren't alone in being uh, in it being legal for them. Um, okay, but this is... Okay. I've got a lot to say about this guy. I mean, I, I really don't have anything against pot. Um, it, it, pot, for me, is like anime. Well, actually, I do have something against pot because the problem with pot is the same thing as the problem with anime, and that's the culture that surrounds it. The culture that surrounds pot is a youth culture of laziness for mostly white and Asian men. It's promoting laziness at the very point in your life where you shouldn't be lazy. And I, I don't doubt that there's a way that you could use pot as sort of part of this balanced breakfast the way that you could use anime. The problem is that so few people do. And, and everything in the culture of pot is, is, is designed to convince you to be the exact opposite way. I'm thinking of like the Judd Apatow movies or sort of the stoner comedies from the Audis. Everything there was there to communicate to you that a life of consumerism could segue you in to a fulfilling life of some kind, and that just isn't the case. You know, maybe in some future world, 
there could be a responsible marijuana using culture the same way there is a responsible wine drinking culture in France and Italy. But that's not the culture we have. The way our culture has absorbed marijuana is the same way that the Native American culture has absorbed alcohol, which is that they've taken the most destructive elements of that drug and they've made them the only way to use that drug. And, and because of that, I, I'm, I, I'm, I really don't like the culture that's emerged around it because the, the, pot, the reason why pot's associated with progressivism is that for young progressive men in blue areas, they're being told, just tap out. Just tap out and indulge yourself. Like, oh, you can't get dates. Just use porn and smoke pot. And and like that and, and, and have the right political opinions. And, and then like and somehow when you're 30, it will just your your white privilege will come in or something like that. It will just gel. That's not the case. To get there now, young men need to put in a lot of footwork. I, I don't know if everyone can get there. I can't who can make promises? You know, I, I don't think we should make promises. But to get there, it's going to require a certain amount of footwork. And that's just not something that pot culture encourages. And, and for that, I, I'm, I'm kind of... I, I was never really a big pot person. But I, I feel like it, it, was a, of a, it was of a kind of a lot of other things that captivated my young imagination and that I have since discovered to be false. And because of that, it's left a bad taste in my mouth. No pun intended. So thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, I, it, it is, it's actually more, ben, pot's more benign in, in, in ruling, in working class people, because working class people, like their culture does not require them to, to chat like intellectually challenge their environment like the the number one thing white men need to bl do in blue areas is to emotionally and intellectually separate themselves from the politics and religion that raised them they need to do that and in order to do that they need to not be comfortable and pot encourages comfort for working class if you're resigned to stay working class um i mean like i'm, I'm not trying to be condescending but like you just need to put your head to the grindstone and cross your fingers that you're lucky enough, uh, you know, uh, not to get sucked into one of these black holes that that our establishments trading around us to destroy people like you. And, and maybe pot is less destructive in that environment. But in 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 my own environment, I grew up around it was a siren call, and 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 so so I always detested what it represented inside blue cultures. Okay, um, Isaac Bradley for USA three dollars. I'm bluegrass. Have you ever heard any of the music from the Hillbilly Thomas? <laughs> it's a group of Dominican monks that make bluegrass. Okay, I'm gonna look that up right away. Okay, well, thank you for the recommendation. I certainly haven't seen any of them. I kind of got out of bluegrass a little bit uh, around 2014. I don't know why. Um. I guess it was just basically that I, I guess the some of the scene became a lot more political as you might expect it was sort of it was sort of a more uh e even in blue areas it was more of a purple thing you know half red half blue and so the woke bug bit it a little bit later but around the era of gamergate it did and so i enjoyed hanging out with those people a lot less and then additionally, like I got really busy with the YouTube channel and all that. And then like, you know, the Catholic stuff I was doing and it just, I kind of got less into it, but I will uh, definitely look into the Hillbilly Thomists. Uh, the name's a little on the nose, guys. Uh, if you're, if you're um, Dominican, Dominican monks is not the right word. It's Dominican friars. Uh, but if you're Dominican friars that are um, bluegrass players, I uh, just just Nate, just have that be like something in the background because it's so cool. You don't need to have it announced in the title, you know. Um, but anyway, I'll, I'll look forward to listening to that music. Thank you very much for the recommendation. Thank you very much for the recommendation. 
Aristocratic Owl for three dollars USA. Check out Eric Sadie's Nasina Number no. One. He was famous for uh, for for starting in 19th century the trend in France known as furniture music, and he would be the best composer in terms of getting intro music for the streams. Sati, well, that, that sounds good. I, I, not uh, 19th century French composers is not my strong suit, but I'll definitely look into that. Thank you very much. Um, people are recommending classical music, so I assume that means that the folk music is not well received. Well, guys, for for the next few weeks, you're going to get folk music for the intro and outro. So, uh, you know, you'll have to deal with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> um. Uh, Sam 153. Cheers, Dave. Um, uh, a tip for your path back to health. Well, I'm, I'm fully recovered. A uh, 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 kind of crinkly throat notwithstanding, a dry throat notwithstanding. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I, 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 I feel like for 2022, I, I'm, we're coming into flu season, so I know I'm going to get sick again. But I mean, we, we've had enough diseases for this this year. So thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate your contributions and your prayers, maybe. I can hope. <laughs> um, <clears throat> um, Remy Copard for $3 USA. So as someone in my early 20s, do you think we will see a dissident right in power for real in my lifetime? Um, well, certainly not in this current form. We are going to see, and, and I, I don't think that once dissident right ideas come into power, they will not be perceived as right wing. They will be perceived as new things. That's how they will be perceived. But we have to be right for the time being because the right is correct the right is right the left is wrong but they will not be perceived that way when they come into power now as a person in their 20s your lifetime is a long time your lifetime is almost a century very likely so i can't exclude the fact that this circulation of the elites will occur within your lifetime but the more overwhelming the overwhelming likely scenario is descent is slow disintegration which means that you're going to have everything kind of fall apart in your lifetime in in in, in, in the, what you're looking at right now in the next few decades of your life in, in in the portion of your life when politics really matter the most salient feature of those politics will be a slow disintegration of the west where things slowly become apart and become disassociated from both each other and from confident orchestration of things. I think that the thing you have to look forward to is dissident groups that take on board right-wing principles, whether they call it that or not. And I think a lot of those, I think what we're seeing right now is a spiritual dead zone. And what we're seeing, you know, in the New York scene and, and through basket weaving and through religious communities is you're seeing places that were ignored feel more prominent and you're seeing that the life they always had feel more valuable as as the fakeness kind of decays around us i mean who wants more fakeness uh, take all of that hatred you have for fakeness and just use it as motivation to walk away from it um so i i would keep keep be uh, be remedy as a 20 year old what you want to be doing is you want to be looking for the God and small things. Look for the small and real and prefer that over the loud and fake. And if you do that enough, I think you'll find something that will persist and that will slowly, it won't build power, but people, people who are competent and who will build for the future will gravitate towards that. And eventually, they will be forced to take power out of necessity, out of a desire to protect that which they love. Aristocratic Owl for $3. Classical music is not elitist. There are plenty of channels and communities 
inside the score is a great example uh is a great channel so i guess i never heard of that one inside the score they're a great way to discover new works from great people who are not snobby well i don't know i don't i don't, I don't think mpr was really mpr's classical music was the least snobby thing about them the problem is is that oftentimes the perception of classical music especially when it's used in promotional material feels like it's virtue it's signaling virtue and i don't like that image i want i like the the folk music communicates a sort of down-to-earth perspective right so i don't know thank you very much though I'll, I'll check out that channel there's a lot of recommendations on this stream um glowy and the dark for three dollars usa thank you very much they will be ironically pushing cannibalism but soon larping but uh they will they be ironically pushing cannibalism but soon larping becomes real with followers as they normalize it to be chaotic chaotic for chaos yeah i mean i'm this it's just you know, it's going to take a long... I mean, society would have to be in real disrepair for them to get to the point where they could unironically pursue cannibalism. Uh, once, uh, So human beings are animals that have certain features about them. And, and one of the features that is a constant in humanity is the fact that we use food to signal caste. This is one of the reasons why socialists always try to hit you for the heart and they hit you in the stomach. Michael Moore's documentaries in the early 2000s were constantly trying to really hit us where it hurt. But Morgan Spurlock's, uh, you know, Supersize Me was the most effective one. Uh, the same thing, Upton Sinclair did a number of socialist works in the 1920s, but he's always remembered for the jungle. And that's only remembered because it described the meatpacking industry industry in a disgusting way. Um, food and disgust communicate caste more than anything else. The second progressives abandon quality food, and quality is unmistakable as quality. They signal that they are no longer the ruling caste. I advise... I'm trying to do this myself. I'm trying to get into wine... I, I highly recommend reactionaries try to adopt culinary traditions. It's just good practice. It will serve you as a social lubricator, as a means of getting status in your workplace for the rest of your life. It, and and, and it, it, will, so it will always serve you. And, and it will also be a direct knife pointed at the throats of other pretenders who are who, who who are progressives eat quality food and focus on quality food in company as a core element of your uh, culture it, it's, it's always valuable and cannibalism just can't be part of it i mean what who are cannibals cannibals are barbarians cannibal and ritualistic cannibals are, are either just they're just complete chaotic they're they're either savages or they're disciples of chaotic demonic religions that are doing it to demonstrate their ability, their, their desire to destroy everything to increase their own power. And deep in our bones, we know this. We know this. We know that the cannibal is the priest of a dying civilization or a person who has no civilization. Um... Aristocratic Owl for $3 USA. Um, oh, where did that go? Pardon me. I'm losing track of my... Um, Aristocratic Owl for $3. Is there any way I can get direct contact? Uh... Um, is there any way I can get in contact with you? I have some great suggestions if you're looking for new audio equipment to upgrade the quality of these streams. Uh, yeah, I'd say Telegram is the best way to get in contact with me. Um, 
email is bad because I'm so backlog on my email. It's embarrassing. It's just it's a it's a tool that I have a hard time using. But if you DM me, I'll respond immediately on Telegram. Um, you can email me. I, I recognize you, Worship Credit Guy. I'll probably reply back faster. So email at data distributist dot at gmail dot com. That'd be probably be a good way to do it. Um, um, I, I owe Bench. I think Benjamin Boyce wants to do a live stream with me too. So that's also going to be on my um, on my uh, 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 menu. I, 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 I'm in the market for a new microphone and soundboards. Although I'm probably going to try to spare money and use. Uh, I'll get a new microphone because I need to get a new microphone. Uh, but I probably am just going to like staple egg cartons to a uh, to to a cardboard fixture to get the sound quality right in this loft. Because this loft is just horrible acoustics, as you're probably hearing right now. Um, Ham Sparta for $3. What's your favorite programming language? Have you used Lisp, C++, or ASM? I have never used ASM or even heard of it. So that is straight up. Uh, is it Ada? Is ASM the same as Ada? It sounds like one of those old languages. C++ is my first programming language. It's actually I'm actually, I feel like I am a competent C++ programmer, but I'm not like a ninja. I'm not like some kind of memory pointer ninja. And uh, C++ is, uh, what can I say about it? It does what it does. It's kind of cool that it does what it does. Uh, but it's, I mean, for development, let's be honest, it's, it's a, a monster. It's just, I mean, it's, I mean, development is all about quick cycle time. I mean, we're not in the 80s anymore, right? So for, for those lay people, C++ is a compiled programming language that was developed in the 70s uh, that's still used today. And it allows you to do anything with the computer. It allows you to move memory at a very, very low level. Uh, the problem is, is, and it's also syntactically very um, parsimonious, I find, too. Great syntax. The difficulty is that because it's so fundamental and because it's so straightforward, its compile times are absolutely insane, especially if you're doing tricks with memory. And because of that, uh, the, the turnaround time, the cycle on your software is insanely large, which makes development an absolute nightmare. Modern development is all about modern cycles, which makes C++, in my opinion, practically unusable. Go is supposed to be a replacement for compiled languages that do the same thing. It's owned by Google, so I naturally hate it. So I don't know. I hope someone comes up with a better version of C++ that solves the long compile time problems. They'll have to re-engineer the syntax, which will be a problem. Um, but, but I love C++. I, it's my first programming language. My favorite one currently is Python because it's just usable and everyone uses it for everything anyway. If you're going to learn one programming language and you're going to be a developer, a general developer, Python is your language. If you're going to do web development, then that's a different route. If you're going to do video games, a different route, right? But if it's just, I need a language that's going to be generally useful for most things, Python. Especially now that it's the primary back end language for most web apps. Um, uh, I, I I love Lisp. Lisp is elegant. It's great. I've only ever used it in a professional context inside the program AutoCAD. Other than that, all it's been is little toy things. But oh, who doesn't like Lisp, right? Lisp is just it's the most fun little toy ever invented for computer science people. But but thank you for the. Uh, who, I've been told people have made actual viable software in Lisp. And I think back in the day, I made the command line stuff in Lisp, and it was great. Um, I, I should do that. I should make a. I should make a Unix script that is basically just an envelope for calling Lisp. It would be. It would be great. Great command line Lisp thing. Um, okay. Uh, is this the last one here? Um, Okay, I, I missed one by um, AMB Maker, so that will be the last one. Okay, uh, Asteroidal Assassin for $10 USA. 
I'm annoyed with how much leftism has been mixed up with degenerative social progressivism. My question is, when talking to other leftists, exactly how do I talk them out of social progressivism, even if it's worth attempting? My Reddit account has been suspended like 10 times doing this already. Okay, so I mean, I'll, 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 I appreciate this sentiment, uh, assassin, but you've got a problem here. And it, it, the problem's got a name, and it's called the political formula. Leftism, by which I assume you mean socialism, works by creating government bureaucracies. That's its main mode of expansion. Otherwise, I don't know what you're talking about when you talk about leftism, properly speaking. Or, or it focuses on human liberation. Okay? Those are the two modes. You've got a problem here. The only way socialism gets implemented and human liberation, like your ability to make whatever choice you want, the way that this advances inside a democracy is by fueling what us reactionaries call the cathedral or what is more generally called the managerial state. It, it fuels this because this is a natural feedback loop between democracy and increasing state power and building institutions. And so as long as you can build institutions, increase state power, and sell that to people as liberation, you have got the cycle of leftward progression that all leftists call the leftward motion of history. You give people what they want, you sell them dependency, and through that process, you advance socialism. But the second, and, and the, the difficulty is, is that if you want to increase the size of the managerial state and, and feed this process, what's the best way to do that? Well, it's to create dependent, socially inept, sick people that can do nothing but rely on the state to bail them out and to create useless bureaucrats who need to go along with towing the line, otherwise they'll lose their job by abolishing the logic of their own departments. That's what the system needs to do to increase its own power through a political formula. And because of that fact, social progressivism, which creates dependence, is inextric it's inextricably linked with the modern advancement of socialist ideas and with sort of radical emancipatory ideas, because that's how those ideas have had their greatest success in, in modern democratic societies. The second you move off of that formula, A, you're going to be perceived as right wing, so there's no point. You'll be in Keith Woods land when you move off that thing. And secondly, the, your ordinary mechanisms, like all the stories you have of leftists winning in the past, all that logic is going to go straight out the window because they all want won in the past by creating these democratic coalitions inside managerial states and by playing sort of bio Leninist games, the way that Spandrel describes. So I, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but they're, they're, by the time you move against, if you move against social progressivism, you are functionally no longer a leftist in any meaningful sense. You can join Keith Woods and Caleb Maupin and, and coming soon, the hosts of Red Scare uh, with, with, with the rest of us distant thinkers, because at that point, you're functionally off of the leftist island. And, and, and everyone on the left knows this now. They can all, you, you, you will lose your ant smell. That's the reason why you've been banned off of Reddit so much, because they see that you want to arrest the process that makes their lifestyles more politically viable and that makes their managerial growth possible. And once you oppose that process, you might as well not be leftist, even if you agree with Marx and the labor theory of value, or even if you want to institute a, a, a government that takes care of people. Uh, for, for any meaningful use of the word, you're no longer on the left. I, you know, so, you know, I, I really sympathize with you, assassin, but this is the reality of the managerial state as Burnham described it. The, the, the social progressivism and the growth of the managerial state are intimately linked because their lifestyle, their life cycle depends on one another. They're mutually reinforcing. And once you oppose one, they understand that you're out to destroy their life cycle and both sides of the leftist project will turn against you. 
That's what you're experiencing. Okay, I missed uh, a super chat from AMV Maker because it was uh, in the questions tab, I think. But this is the last one of the night. Nerve AMV Maker for $10 USA. I started to realize the history, primarily USA, is written by the left and usually is more useful than history by normicons. Left-wing history is often accurate but morally inverted. It is easy to ignore that inversion. Normicons twist and obfuscate a lot more facts in order to make history inoffensive. I would definitely agree with you, Nerve and Bean Maker, when you're talking about the 20th century post World War II. I would say that you you can get a lot. I mean, like I'm looking at Bill O'Reilly's career, and you always know a shit Normicon book when it's about Winston Churchill. Any Normicon book that describes Winston Churchill as a success, and they all describe him as a success, uh, misunderstands the character of Winston Churchill. Because the net effect of what was Winston Churchill's objective all throughout his political career to save the empire? Who destroyed the empire? Who destroyed the British Empire? Winston Churchill. There's no way you can tell an accurate story of Winston Churchill without him being described as a failure, period. Glippily notwithstanding. And, and Normie Cons don't take that perspective, but then you go back. And there are some damn good Normicon takes of, you know, I haven't read a lot of history by them, but Normicons were reading uh, Democracy in America by de Tocqueville before, it was, before reactionaries were. And that's like a pretty based book, actually. There's a lot of insight in that book. And that infused their narratives about the early, um, early 19th century. So early 19th century t uh, stories or, or hist history is not half bad it's really when you get to the world war one world war two stuff that normie can start twisting things because they have to sort of start covering their tracks and and create political distinctions that i think are really less meaningful uh but yeah i, I know what you mean my, my wife is sort of more a normie con and she you know she she has more than a few books by bill o'reilly and a lot of them are unreadable uh, there's there's a lot of stuff there, but I mean, you you don't you don't want to read like something like I mean Howard Zinn. I mean, what is there to really? Howard Zinn's really when you stop you start you start you're a long way from like Carl Sandburg and Gore Vidal. By the time you get to Howard Zinn, uh, a lot of that's a lot of that is just very very um, very ideological. And, and there are truths here and there, but they are um, very much uh, they're they're too they're they're too much half truths at that stage. Anyway, that is the end of the super chats, and because we're doing things sort of more the classical way today, um, I'm going to read my poem, <clears throat> which is not particularly original. It is simply uh, it's by John Dunn. And it is John Don, John Don, it's John Dunn, I think. No, it's pronounced John Don. And this is, Him to God, my God, in my sickness. Um, I came across this one when I was suffering from coronavirus, so I, I thought of it. Since I'm coming to that holy room, where with my choir of saints forevermore, I shall be made thy music as I come. I tune the instrument here at the door, and what I must do then, think now before, whilst my positions by their love are, gro are grown, cosmographers and I their map who lie. Flat is this bed, by them, by, flat on this bed, by them, may be shown that this is my southwest discovery, perferitum febris, by these straits to die. I joy that in these traits I see my west, for, th for though their currents yield return to none, what shall my west hurt me as west and east? In all flat maps am I am one, are one, so death does touch the resurrection. Is the Pacific Sea my home, or are, or are the eastern riches? Is Jerusalem 
Anyan, Magellan, Gibraltar, all straits and none but straits are ways to them. Whether where Japhet dwelt or Sham or Shem, we think that paradise and Calvary, Christ's cross and Adam's tree stood in one place, Lord, Lord, and find Adam's met in me. As the first Adam's sweat surrounds my face, may the last Adam's blood my soul embrace. So in his purple wrapped, receive me, Lord. By these his thorns, give me his other crowns. And as to other souls, I preach thy word. Be this my text, my sermon, of, my sermon to my own. Therefore, that he may arise, the Lord, in thrones drawn. So that is a very early poem, but one appropriate for sickness. And I think that is everything for tonight. So uh, I will leave you guys now with my outro music and have a wonderful evening and a blessed rest of the week.